There we go. Um, okay, I see guests and I'm counting members. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we're here. Okay. Um, good evening. This is the meeting of Town Services and Outreach Committee of the Town Council. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by Zoom or by telephone. The instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted. But every um, the word is spelled director here, but I think every something effort will be made to ensure that public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by way of via technological means. And I will call the uh, committee to order. Um, Andrew Steinberg. Present. And Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. And uh, Anika Lopes. Present. And Shalini Balmil. Present. And I, Dorothy Pam. And I will acknowledge the um, guests that we have. Um, we have Haley Bolton, the director of the Senior Center, and Rosemary Koffler uh, from the Friends, I think it's the Friends of the Senior Center. Is that correct, Rosemary? Um, unmute, and, please. And also the Council on Aging. Council on Aging, right. That's fair. And, and then we, have, we have our uh, three CFOs, um, Jennifer Moyston and Brianna Sundred and Angela Mills. And we have our town manager, Paul Bachelman, and our town clerk. Athena O'Keefe. So we are here. Um, and there was some discussion about when we would have public comment and we are moving it up to uh, be the first item of the agenda. Uh, so it would precede the discussion of the Senior Center and Senior Services Overview. Um, is that, that is my understanding, is that correct? Is that how you'd like it, Haley? Sure, yes, that'd be great. Great, okay. Um, so is there anything else I should do while we're, we're all set to go now? Can we start our presentation? Paul, oh, yeah. Just to clarify, you're gonna do um, public comment, then you're gonna do the presentation by the senior center, and then you'll do the presentation by the CPOs. Is that the way it will lined up? Right, and should we, have, we can have another public comment after that. Does that seem okay? Sure, and then I think for tonight, we, we you've already agreed that the Transportation Advisory Committee charge is going to be post, postponed to another night. Yeah. And if you want to talk about speed limits, I can give you a brief overview, but that should probably go at the same time you talk about with TAC, I think, okay. if that makes sense. And you have some appointments for us. I have one appoint one set of appointments, yes. Okay, so we, we should have a nice meeting tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so um, public comment. Um, public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the TSO committee. Um, residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes at the discretion of the TSO chair based upon the number of people who want to speak. TSO will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. And the directions for participating in public comment are given. So um, let me just see what we have um, in terms of attendees. Um, I see seven and um, any attendees who would like to uh, speak at this time, please raise your hand. Okay, and so I see um, Richard Yorga has his hand up and um, let's see, there are a few more people coming on, I see that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move this. So I have a little screen that tells me who's here. Is it blocking your vision of people or is it only blocking my vision? Okay, I'm gonna see if I can't pull it over to the side, but it's not working. Okay, so, okay. So um, Mr. Yorga, you have the floor. And can you unmute yourself so that we can hear you? There, there we go. Good. Okay. Yorga, I have, thank you for the opportunity. I've lived in Amherst now for, it's hard to believe, 59 years. So I've been a taxpayer in the town of Amherst for many, many, many years. I, I, I don't even want to know how many 
thousands of dollars I've contributed <clears throat> to the town of Amherst. And I'm happy to have done so. But now as a senior, I think it's time for the seniors to get a little recognition for all the money we've paid in, all the committees we've served on, all the help we've been to everyone of every age in the town. Um, I'm very active at the Senior Center, um, currently serving as president of the, of, of the Friends, and I'm also president of the uh, Amherst Soul Council. Um, I've spent so many years at the Senior Center, and now I'm starting to look around and seeing what our neighbors have. Uh, and what our neighbor communities of much smaller populations and what they're providing for their seniors. And Amherst should be embarrassed. I realize Amherst has lots of responsibilities, lots of needs as every town does. Um, but I think it's time for the Amherst seniors to speak up and get in line uh, to, to get better representation, better services from the town that we've spent our entire adult lives, many of us contributing it to. Uh, it's, time, um, it, it's time for the, the town to do better for its Amherst seniors. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look at the attendees again and see, okay, I see Ching Ching Sernada. Uh, could you please unmute yourself and you have the floor. Actually, it's George Sonata. Oh, thank you. I'm just going by what's in front of me. Hello, George. That's because I have her iPad. I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much for correcting. So I'm gonna make sure I put that in my minutes. Okay, so go ahead and give us your thoughts on this topic. Yes, uh, well, like the gentleman before me, I. I retired about 20 years ago in Amherst. I quickly became a member of the, the Senior Center group, and I participated in many, many programs, probably over these 20 years. Uh, I delivered meals for five years, and I organized a memoir writing group for over 15 years. The memoir group is no longer working, space problems at the center. Uh, so much construction was going on with the, uh, the uh, this was before COVID. Uh, we were sort of much ran out of space. Uh, our dance class that we were in has disappeared for lack of space. Uh, it, it's presently in the pole room, which was never quite up to standard. My wife having fallen down a couple of times in there, given the terrible flooring that's in there, and me having once been knocked down by the poles that are in that room. <laughs> I always thought pole room was something a little different than what they described it as. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I just want to say, we I've seen the development of the center over 20 years. And I have to say, it, it, it I'm not sure that it's any worse than it, it, I, when we came, we thought it was wonderful. Over the years, the whole physical structure has deteriorated. I mean, it was so evident to me when I appeared the other evening for the, uh, the celebration. And I thought to myself, I saw a person trying, trying to get down the stairs and everybody was standing in front of it. And I think people aren't cognizant of the fact that we have so many balance problems as seniors that were of an age the structure there just isn't working for people and there isn't enough room. Uh, I know that things are being done elsewhere, but we're not, we're not, we're not getting it, I think. I could say much, much more, but I think that's my, my input. And I just hope that we can do like, you know, the uh, plans we say we're going to serve the senior citizens, but I think we're not doing a good job of this anymore. We really are. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I see that Kay has her hand up. Can you um, identify yourself? And as I should have said to the previous speakers, um, give your address in Amherst uh, or give your address. So Kay, I'd love to hear from you. You, you need to unmute yourself.
Okay, Good. can you hear me now? Yes, yes I can. Okay. First off, I would like to thank everyone uh, here uh, for giving us at the Senior Center an opportunity to voice our concerns. Um, I am a resident of Amherst. I live at 23 Greenleaves Drive. And I am a member of the Friends as well as a volunteer. I volunteer three days a week, which I absolutely enjoy. I work at the reception desk and I also do the lunch program. Uh, working at the reception desk, I have firsthand knowledge of what is lacking and what is needed at the senior center. Um, I get a lot of complaints over the phone. Uh, for example, there is, uh, they complain about the inadequate parking space and the cost for parking. They also, there's also complaints about not having enough programs because we lack space. Uh, the other thing is we also don't have enough adequate staff to run classes at the senior center. And we also, I mean, there is a list to go on and on. Um, also, we have very little budget to plan for events. And last but not least is we lack transportation services, which I think our seniors need desperately because at one time we had um, transportation uh, to provide uh, the rides to medical doctors for their doctor's visits. Mm -hmm. And right now we don't have a, an adequate van, our van is broken. And so I can't imagine us not even having one at this point. So, and also the atmosphere is very dismal as far as I'm concerned. It gets very depressing when you walk in there. Um, I have looked at several community area senior centers and by far it outshines ours. Um, and this situation has been going on for a very long time. The needs of our senior population, which exceeds over 5,000 and growing has long been overlooked and neglected. Uh, we seem to live in an age where uh, youth is, um, is more important. You know, we, we have a, a youth oriented society and we have an aging population. And I think more emphasis and focus has to be on our needs as well. We have contributed as, as Dick has said, where we have longstanding taxpayers. So right, right now, I feel that what we need is a commitment uh, from the town of Amherst to build a new senior center to accommodate our often neglected senior population. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back and check the list again. Uh, I don't see any more hands raised, so I will close the public comment unless somebody pops a hand up real quick. Okay. All right, so that is the end of public comment. Um, so um, now, Haley, would you like to um, start your presentation? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I've got a brief presentation, um, and then I can take questions after. So I'll start by sharing my screen. All right, so I'm here tonight with Rosemary Koffler, Council on Aging, um, member of the leadership team there, and on the Amherst Friends Group, and we're going to talk about senior services. So one of the questions that we get asked a lot are, what, we, what are the essential senior services? And I think that we could really break them down into four uh, groups. So we've got monthly brown bag program, emergency food pantry referral to programs like the Amherst Survival Center. Um, we know that our seniors live on fixed incomes. We are facing unprecedented gas prices, inflation. Um, so seniors really have to do more with less um, pretty constantly. So it's important that a senior center be able to offer them ways to save money on their food bills. And we also know that meal preparation is a burden, right? If you think about the time and the energy that it takes to prepare, to cook, to clean a meal, um, it's quite burdensome to our seniors and particularly when they're caregivers for a family member. So senior centers ought to provide a meal, um, at least one. Some senior centers provide two or three a day. 
um, and home delivered meals as well. Uh, we know that social connection is important, arts and crafts, music activities, group fitness, um, games, uh, book clubs, even just coming in and being able to read the newspaper, having an opportunity for seniors to connect with one another, be um, visible in the community, engage. Um, those are all really important. They help you know, alleviate depression. They keep your mind sharp. We know that we want our seniors to be involved in the community that they've been a part of their whole lives. Um, it's really important to offer seniors educational workshops. You know, how do you age in place? How do you get modifications to your home? How do you navigate Medicare? What are the onset symptoms of dementia? How to live with um, diabetes? You know, all these things are topics that we face as we get older and senior centers need to be able to educate the public on that. And it's also really important to have health clinics, foot clinics, um, blood pressure, hearing aids. Um, ear irrigation, those services are really helpful to seniors to be able to get, you know, all in one place. If I come to do a music activity, I can get my blood pressure checked and I can have a meal and that saves them from having to make multiple trips out. So those are all important. And then there's the individual services, right? So application assistance, SNAP, fuel assistance, um, licensed social work counseling, case management, computer tutoring, income tax preparation, all those things help save seniors money and time. Um, and all those things we already do at the Amherst Senior Center. So we uh, provide a lot of essential services um, to the population already. And when we talk about essential services, we need to also be thinking about, you know, who's using the Senior Center, right? So we know that there's 39,000 people in town, and that number does include off-campus students. It's really important to note that. Um, someone had mentioned earlier over 5,200 seniors live in Amherst. That's 13% of the population. That's a really statistically significant amount of people. Um, when we look at, you know, the number of individuals we're serving each year. Um, so the last pre-COVID year, FY19, over 2,100 individuals um, access senior center services during the course of that year. And, you know, that's an unduplicated number. If we looked at duplicated, it would be much higher. Um, and then during COVID last fiscal year, almost 1,800 people. So that's about 35% of the town seniors are accessing services at the bank center. Again, we're, we're seeing a large volume of people. And when we look ahead, we have about 1,500 people living in Amherst between the ages of 50 and 59. Over half of those people, so about 900 people, are 55 to 59. So within the next five years, we're going to see an even bigger demand on senior services. And that's not taking into consideration that the Pioneer Valley is quickly becoming a retirement destination. People really want to come here. They want to spend their golden years. It's bucolic. There's um, the influences of the college. There's a vibrant art scene. People want to be a part of our community. So we'll see more numbers. Um, and again, just to kind of go back and talk about the budget. So the town allocates $235,000. $1,000 to the senior center, 99.9% .9 of that budget is salary. That leaves us with about $2,700 to spend in a fiscal year on operating expenses, maybe programs. Um, you know, we do pay dues to the Massachusetts Council on Aging. Those dues are over $900. Um, so we really have to get creative with how we fund and sustain our programs. And what that means is that we're reliant on grants and fundraising. The Friends of the Amherst Senior Center are critical to our success. Uh, they allow us to do pretty much every program that we offer. But the flip side of that, when you think about who's donating money to the Friends Group, it's seniors. <laughs> so if I'm a senior in Amherst and I want a program, I don't have to spend my own money to donate to sustain that. And it puts an unfair burden on our seniors. You know, they shouldn't have to put money out of their own fixed incomes, you know, those limited incomes to sustain programs. And I think um, it's really important to, to look at neighboring communities. We hear a lot about, you know, this town is doing this, this town is doing that. Um, so let's look at some numbers. If you look at the square footage of a senior center, we, we are dwarfed by just about every other community. 20,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet. You know, most of these buildings were built, um, you know, 20, uh, 2000 and beyond. So they're much more modern than the one that we're working with. Um, but the figures that I really want to talk about are, are the budgets, right? Let's look at um, dollar per senior, $45.53 versus $99.63 for our closest neighbor, Northampton. 
you know, uh, Northampton has 5,100 seniors, so they're pretty close in population to us. They're spending double what we do on our seniors, and they have nine full-time staff compared to our three. Um, you know, other communities, Belchertown, that's almost $200 per senior. You know, these numbers are pretty jarring uh, when you look at, you know, what other towns are investing in their older adults. Um, so I'm going to talk about a needs assessment survey, and Rosemary, if you want to jump in, um, she can speak a little bit more about the history of the Long Range Planning Committee at the Senior Center. But Rosemary, you muted. You're right. Thank you. And thank you uh, to the committee for having us. Um, between 2011 and 2017, various members of a long range planning committee for the Council on Aging visited 17 new senior centers in, wow. Mass in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Information was gathered from the directors of each of those centers about the building site, the project manager, the architect, the construction bids, and the building process. One member of that committee also met with architect William Sterling of Sterling Associates. He's an expert in senior center design. Based on Sterling's recommendations and the number of seniors in town, it was recommended that Amherst have a building that would, would include a one-story structure on two acres of land with 20 to 25,000 square feet of space and a minimum of 129 parking places. Incidentally, Amherst is the only center of the 17 visited and perhaps the only center in the state where seniors have to pay to park in order to use their facility. A standalone senior center was recommended as opposed to a shared facility or a community center, which might include a leisure services or a teen center. The space needs for, for a leisure center or a teen center were considered. And although there are some common areas or rooms that can fulfill the needs of both a senior center and a community center, most needs are different enough that they require separate buildings. And if you look, um, you know, we, we recently had the age dementia survey and some of the responses revealed many comments um, from seniors who are not happy with our current space. If you look at that, please build us a proper senior center. If you build it, people will come. And we heard that from many of the other directors at senior centers that were new. They said their numbers went up greatly once they had a new senior center. The senior center is housed in a very unattractive, unwelcoming space. Other towns around Amherst have new nice spaces. Why, when we pay such high taxes, is the senior center such a low priority? And senior center does the best with what they have. Town is overall not supportive of senior center. Compared to other towns, senior center is small and doesn't have a lot of staff. Understand that the town has many priorities, but seniors are pushed aside. Uh, and I'll go forward now, if you're ready, Rosemary. Uh, the issues, yes, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. The issues at the bank center. Well, inadequate program space, you've heard that before. Scheduling space for programs is a juggling problem. The bottom line is we need more classroom space. The most desirable classroom has to double as a lecture room and a yoga classroom. All instructor, instructors want to use that room as a first choice. The computer room has to double as a game room. The lunch room is occupied for lunch from 10 to two, limiting when a dance or exercise class can be held. Rooms are not designed with seniors in mind. Most older adults have hearing issues. Most rooms at Bangs have poor acoustics and they're very echoey, especially for those with hearing aids. The rooms lack assisted listening devices. 
there's no dedicated space for specific activities. Examples, the computer room doubling as a game room makes it noisy for those working on the computer. The center lacks a crafts room, a proper exercise room, a proper dance space, and a game room. The dance room prior to COVID had poles throughout the room, making it dangerous for movement, as you've already heard. You can imagine 16 people swing dancing and trying to avoid bumping into poles. Mm -hmm. And a dance room should also have mirrors for safety purposes. There's a lack of safety features. Bathrooms lack pull cords in the event an elder suddenly needs help. Hallways have no handrails along the walls for those with balance issues. And there should be surveillance cameras throughout the building. Deficient out of code kitchen facility. The food area prep area is extremely small and one of the stoves is not even functional. There is only one sink which violates health safety codes. In fact, when food is prepared for a party, Public health has to look the other way. Heat and cooling issues are a long-standing problem. The lower level at the large activity or lunchroom are often cold, while at the same time, the lounge and offices are overheated. Dark rooms. Most of the classrooms for seniors are on the basement level with no outdoor windows, a very depressing feeling. The most desirable classroom is on the first floor with good windows and natural lighting. Obviously, instructors prefer that room. If it's not available when they need it, the next semi-appropriate room for classes is in the basement with no windows and no natural lighting. There simply is not enough storage space for at, at the bank center. We need storage space for exercise equipment, convalescent loan equipment, craft supplies, office supplies, and the food pantry. We need to use large metal storage cabinets for such things now. And then they have to line the hallways or the walls in the rooms, which is also a safety hazard. So thank you. Go ahead, Haley. All right. So the reason that we're here tonight is we want to we want to make some asks. Um, the senior center desperately needs a building that has thoughtful considerations for seniors. You know, a lot of the issues that we're talking about are also tremendous safety issues to not have pull cords in the bathroom. It's not um, outside the realm of possibility to imagine someone on a Friday afternoon at a program goes to the bathroom in the basement and has a fall and we have no way of knowing that that person is there how can we attend to their needs? Uh, you know, the handrails, we heard a lot of people talking about balance issues. If someone falls, we ought to have handrails going down the corridors. Um, and particularly in the kitchen, you know, you're in a galley setting, so it's it's not safe to take something out of the oven where someone is going to be back to back with you. You know, I worked in professional kitchens before. It, it's not suitable um, to do any kind of large scale meal. And if you remember what we were talking about in, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, we need to have a way to give seniors meals. It's really important that a senior center does that, but we can't safely provide that service. Um, you know, the wayfinding is challenging. It's very dark in the bank center. If someone has, um, you know, low visual acuity, you know, they're going to have a difficult time navigating where they need to go. Uh, the parking, it's expensive. It's hard to find, particularly during the school year. And really that that's very atypical for a senior center. I, I've not been to really any um, in that I know of that has seniors pay for their own parking and doesn't have enough of it. Um, we need specific rooms for programs, a specific arts and crafts space, a, a nursing facility, a room for games, a room for dance classes, a room for exercise equipment. You know, these are all things that our competitors, right? If we can think of them that way in, in Hadley and in South Hadley and Holyoke where they have brand new buildings, these are all things they can offer, but we can't. And it's difficult to compete with that when you're trying to get people to come and enjoy the programs and the services that you can offer. 
So the building is a big ask. Um, and in order to do that, we really need to identify some funding sources to get some design and architectural estimates and, you know, and perhaps a feasibility study so that we can, you know, assess where's the best location. Is it a new site? Is it remodeling a school? Um, those are things that we're going to have to consider uh, if we want to move forward with a new building. So I'll stop sharing uh, my screen now. And I can take questions. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. Okay, Anna. Haley, you had said uh, 2,109 um, people used the services, mm -hmm. I think in 2020 or 2019. Uh, FY19. FY19. Um, those were all Amherst residents who were seniors. The, ma the vast majority, yeah. yeah. Thank you. The vast majority, like 90%, like roughly. Like, oh, um, sorry. So about, I would say like 96%. So a very small subset of people will come from other communities, but we are uh, primarily serving the Amherst community. Um, and then, but they were all seniors. Yes. Okay. Um, and then my other question was, how do you, uh, and this is more curiosity. Mm -hmm. So we have places like Applewood that serve our community very well. Do you work with them on programming? Do you work with them? Is there collaboration between the senior center and Applewood? And if so, what does that look like? So I can say not yet. Um, you know, it really wasn't until very recently that I could even offer in-person activities at the bank center to that scale. So certainly um, we did actually have Applewood attend our open house. They had a table um, and I know that we, you know, that's a community that we want to be working with pretty closely. Um, so the way that I envision collaborations is certainly, you know, folks from Applewood are welcome to attend programs. I want to hear what they're interested in, what they're not getting at Applewood that they might um, like to come and enjoy downtown. Can I piggyback on that a little bit about the number of people that are using the senior center? When we did a survey in 2010, of course, that's a long time ago, but the key, one of the key points in the survey is that the senior services are heavily utilized with 46% of all residents 50 and older having used center services. Two thirds of all residents over 70, nearly, uh, nearly 75% of those residents over 75 have used seven center services. It's very heavily used, at least before COVID. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anika, I saw your hand a minute ago. Um, Want to ask your question or? My question was answered, but um, I just wanted to um, add it. I'm sure that that, uh, that outreach would include uh, green leaves as well. Oh, yes. Right. Yep. Thank you. I was like so zoned in on my, <laughs> my district five people in Applewood. Yeah. Um, well, I have a question then. Um, one of the things that I have noticed, uh, I, I do know that I saw the kitchen. You showed me the kitchen mm -hmm. and it was uh, minuscule. Um, and I was a director of a senior center, and I will say that the main draw was its incredible gold dinner hot meal at lunchtime. Um, you know, roast beef, uh, chicken, that kind of stuff. Um, and that brought people from all income levels in, mm -hmm. which is very important because, I mean, when the centers were founded, they were mainly, the main purpose was joint eating because they found seniors were not eating well on their own. So... Um, do you, in your plans, I mean, there's a lot of these bag lunches and things and, and, and little simple things. Do you plan real dinners of that sort at midday or are you thinking of more like light lunches in your kitchen? It in a perfect world, I would do meals like that. Um, you know, when I was the director of the Burners and Senior Center, we had a... Um, an area agency on aging called Life Path, and they would provide us meals. And you might get, you know, 35 to 40 people. Um, I made homemade chicken soup once, and I got almost 100 people to show up. All, you know, all seniors. They want mm -hmm. home cooked. I know that's a fact. Um, it really just comes down to staffing and volunteers and an adequate space. I would not feel comfortable doing large-scale food preparation with the facility that we have now. Um, but I would certainly like to be able to do so. Yeah. Because I tell you, I've reached the point now where I'm just so sick of cooking and I'm eating soup and cottage cheese. 
it's, um, I'm just it's a burden. not doing it. I'm not doing it. And mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would like to see a senior center that could provide meals like that for people. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we are so blessed to have farms all over the place. You know, I would certainly love to see collaboration with our local farmers, get local produce in and cook healthy and delicious meals for seniors. You know, again, meal preparation is a burden. It's a burden for any age, but particularly our older adults. And again, particularly when they're caregivers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions that we have at this moment? I'm trying to figure out how to. Um, okay. Um, well, I had a, an, uh, oh, Shalini, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Kaylee and Rosemary for, and all the others who came today to speak and inform us about what's happening and what, I mean, we kind of knew it, but it's really powerful to see all of the numbers and everything that was shared. Um, and um, so thank you for doing that. Um, and just like, I'm I mean, of course, we're going to have more conversations, I'm sure, with Paul afterwards and we'll, even amongst ourselves, what we can do. Um, but meanwhile, uh, in terms of partnerships, I would think that UMass and Hampshire College, like in terms of programming or mm -hmm. even food, like the dining services there are so amazing. Or are there any conversations with them? Um, certainly for programs, yes. Um, we have the members of the UMass Psychology Department coming in next week to do a presentation on mindfulness. Mm. Um, we had a nutrition demo um, mm. a month ago with a mm -hmm. class there. So there's lots of opportunities. And, you know, mm. now that we can kind of plan a bit more, I want to do, you know, the food programs. Mm. UMass is renowned for that. So I would love to get a piece of that. Yeah. And I wonder if, Paul, it, part of our negotiations with or our ongoing conversations with UMass that could be something that we, I mean, unless we're already doing that to get them to um, to provide. It could be, you know, the, their fine arts and their entertain, mm -hmm. like the, the talent there and the food. Yes. And, uh, you know, just so many opportunities, I think, for um, oh, contributing. And given that you all have a staff of three, I'm just wondering how we can take off some of the burden that you're not the only person who's reaching out and building these partnerships, but mm. how that could be spread out a little bit. And if there's an overlap already, sorry. So typically that would not happen at the level that we're talking about. A lot of those kind mm -hmm. of uh, co collaborations happen at the department to department level. Uh, it happens, you know, where people will mm -hmm. connect directly because UMass, as you know, is pretty decentralized. It's not going to be like the chancellor negotiating what meals get delivered. Uh -huh. you, you, right. I think there'd be a connection. We can help uh, forge that connection. Uh -huh. uh, but it, something like that at that level wouldn't be at the strategic partnership agreement level. But okay. we certainly help with the support that kind of collaboration. Yeah. But there's right. a lot of collaboration, like the Board of Health has tremendous collaboration with uh -huh. the health director with people at UMass directly. That's not negotiated. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of connections that people make. Right. And I every time I've spoken with uh, Nancy Buffon and Tony Maroulis at their community outreach office, I, what I've understood is that they've really emphasized that for any of our issues in town, reaching out to them, and then they can help find on campus who is the you know, the contact person or to make that introduction and everything. So I, I would really encourage um, making that contact and figuring out what, how they can help us. Okay, um, Andy. Um, well, Rosemary and Haley, thank you for the presentation. It was, uh, I think, very helpful and sobering. The, I have two questions about what we've heard from, including some of the comments, just out of curiosity. One is, um, I thought of, at one time we were had a parking pass program where um, people from, who were patrons of the senior center would be able to get parking permits uh, for when they're using the center. Is that no longer in place? No, we do still have the parking permits, but the issue with that tends to be the availability of spaces. Um, you know, I, 
it struck me today, I was walking back and forth to town hall. Um, you know, it's really hard to use the law by Johnny's. A lot of times there's trucks dropping off food, picking up supplies. So that cuts into the availability of spaces. Um, and just in general, downtown, it's very hard to find a parking space. And the, the senior center parking permit is limited to just the immediate um, spaces by the bank center. So it, it's not, um, okay. it's not as attractive an option as you as you might just think. It also is not free. They do pay for that parking pass. And of course, it's a lot cheaper than putting money in the meter, but um, it's $25 for the year. Mm -hmm. And if a senior only comes twice a year, that's not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, could I ask a quick question? When you say if it's limited to the parking places by the banks, do you mean five or 10 spaces or do you mean 20 spaces? believe it's the lower lot that's in front of Ann Whalen. So I think it's more than 10 spaces. I'm not sure if it's more than 20. Oh, they can use the Boltwood Walk, Haley. And the Boltwood Walk, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Boltwood Lot. Andy, do you have more questions? Your hand is still Yeah, up. no, that was helpful. And I guess I need to get a little bit more report back from some, uh, some of our parking supervision staff fully understand it. The other uh, question was about the van is, I know we had a van. Uh, do we still have a van? Is it, and what is the situation with yes, this? Yes, we have a van. It's at DPW. It's been there for the duration of COVID, but it's not a usable van. So there's significant rust damage in the undercarriage. There's a lot of mouse activity in that van. Um, brake lines are rusted. Um, now I have been working with PBTA. We are set to acquire one of their retired um, vans, you know, there, but it's not a brand new vehicle. It's a blessing for sure. Don't get me wrong, but it has 137,000 miles on it. Um, so it's not a new facility, but it will be a tremendous help for us to be able to resume our trip program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is that is that it for you, Andy? Yes. Okay. No, Shalini, I see you have a question. This was a question for Paul, maybe. Uh, you know, the table that uh, comparison table that Haley shared with other senior centers. And I'm wondering, like, what explains the variation in the non salary part of the budget? Like where we have two thousand dollars, two thousand seven hundred, and other towns have like sixty-eight thousand, or nine thousand, or eighty-five thousand, mm -hmm. or one hundred seven thousand. So, what? How did? I mean, yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, I, I think that's really a discussion. I mean, that's a topic the finance committee would be looking at, um, okay. and I'm sure uh, Haley will be talking to the finance committee about that. Um, so I have not studied that, and we'd want our finance mm -hmm. officers here to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else, Shalini? Maybe for Haley, then do you know what, like, what is that money being used for in the other towns? Uh, without having spoken to their director, okay. yeah. um, I can definitely make inferences that, you know, office supplies, like I said, um, you know, mm. each council on aging, that's a member of the state councils on aging, they pay mm. membership dues. Um, and a lot of senior centers will use those operating expenses for things like volunteer recognition, special mm. events, events um, right? You know, things like that. Yeah. And we do that through grants and donations. Is it? Primarily. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to um, add a comment here. When I was a director, I had a budget and I hired singers, violinists, comedy acts, mm. Um, we also did performances. I directed a, a silly thing called Dancing Through the Decades, where the seniors performed songs from like the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and whatever. Um, but, you know, we had more staff and we had a budget. Um, so I, I, it, your, your statistics were extremely useful. I'm very, very surprised at them. And, um, you know, I, I hope that. We've got so many things on our plate right now, but I hope we can figure out some way to do a better, better job, a fairer job. Well, this has been um, fantastic, you know, and I, I do appreciate everyone's attention to senior topics and the the commitment that um, we're all showing here today by talking about it. And I see Shalini has her hand up again. Yeah, I had another question for Haley as we're like discussing these things without you being there. Uh, you know, like ha a building project mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to even go there, but uh, but we have needs, 
right? And so transportation, um, programming, funding for programs and events and all of those things. So as we're talking about those things, is it a possibility? It, is it a possibility at all to have like a focus place for like all the dance classes that may happen you know like you have center dance studio for instance or bar you know some other accessible place and is that not going to be user friendly for seniors if we or do they does everything happen have to happen in one place so you're talking like if we did them off-site? Um, yeah, like if all the dance classes were moved to a place that we can rent or something. Mm. I think that that would be okay for our younger seniors. But when we're talking about people, um, you know, anyone who has, you know, a physical limitation, um, and mm -hmm. certainly our, our older seniors, that's not um, a good fit for them because you know, just think, mm -hmm. put yourself in their shoes. It takes so much energy to get mm -hmm. ready, to get out the door. And then, you know, you're asking someone to drive here, find parking, get mm -hmm. out, then go back in your car, drive someplace else, find parking. Mm -hmm. You know, I hope that it sounds exhausting as I'm explaining it because for somebody like that, it is, that's the reality. Thank you. Okay, I think, Paul, you've got your hand up. Love to yeah. Hear I just want to sort of sum up with this. I mean, this has been a need that's been articulated by the um, Council on Aging and the Friends of Senior Centers, and they do a very strong job, and I've encouraged them to advocate for themselves, and this is great that they are doing that. Um, the challenge we have, obviously, is that is another capital project, um, and the other challenge is location. So right now, our senior center is adjacent to the largest concentration of seniors in the town, um, but there's no parking. If you move, move into a place that has parking, then you also need to provide transportation for folks, because uh, transportation was identified uh, by the prior director as being the number one priority for seniors. Um, and just in terms of knowing that we had a, a um, not the newest facility, um, but we'd make do with what we have, we did make improvements to the senior center uh, last year. And I think we made, we invested a fair amount of money into making it a much more agreeable place, uh, got rid of some of the lower furniture, you know, the furniture that wasn't appropriate for a location like that got furniture that was higher up um, did re kitchen renovations in the senior center and did made a significant investment into the existing space mm -hmm. recognizing that it's not suitable um, and the other thing that we did just trying to make the best we can is that with the prior director i changed the title to director of senior services instead of mm -hmm. senior center because my belief is that we should be delivering services to people where they are to utilize many spaces because we have to you know we have lots of we have other spaces munson library we'll soon have a north amherst library available uh, a meeting room up there that we can utilize for additional um, okay. services mm -hmm. and also just to, to is what we're trying to do with the recreation department as well take the activities to where people are and engage them haley's been phenomenal at engaging with people and you know we've had covid for two years which sort of inhibited everyone but you know just so you know that the town is investing in the in the space um, we're, we're hiring talented people um uh, and we have social social workers available um and you know trying to get some of the services that we lost along the way back in place and i think the i think truly i want to recognize um rosemary's leadership and the other folks in the audience who've done a really tremendous job of um stewarding us through the change of leadership from a director who's been here was here for decades uh, to Mary Beth and now to Haley and it's I think the leadership is really strong um, but we have a lot to do and I think one of the things for the council to consider is where how does this fit in to our needs and, and I think that it has to be articulated that the need is there. Um, I want to uh, add one question it's, uh, in a conversation that I had with Rosemary and Haley um, I mentioned the fact that you've just brought up that that uh, where the placement of the center and why did we need to stay in the center of downtown because of being near uh, Clark House and Ann Whalen. And I believe they said that the attendance from those two houses was not actually that high. So I wanted to verify that. Um, but that another place in town, particularly if there were a brand new center, if we had transportation would work. But I, I want to ask Haley if I understood that correctly. I think the a different location would work. Um, you know, we do have we have a woman who comes to the senior center every afternoon. She does a little walk around the neighborhood and then comes and plays cards. 
and I asked her, you know, I know, I know that you live nearby, but if we had a different location, would you, if we had our own van, would you come to that? And she said, yes, absolutely. If you, if we had a van that could pick her up and bring her to the senior center, she'd be there in a heartbeat. Um, so I think that really having, you know, the PVTA bus route, the existing bus route is very helpful. There's the paratransit. And then if we had our own senior center bus, um, that gives people ample opportunities to be able to get to the senior center if it was um, not downtown. Thank you. Uh, Anna, see your hand. Yeah, so this is, Paul, I'm going to funnel this through you, I guess. Um, looking at the, we all have budgets on the brain, looking at the capital improvement program um, and the capital budget for the next five years. I mean, I'm, I don't see the senior center van on here. And so I'm curious if that's, if there's a plan to work that back into the capital budget or is it offline and not getting brought back? Like what's the, what's the thought there? And if that's uh, a question for Sean or, or whoever down the road, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, it's been presented as a need, uh, but we we can uh, I can we can check with Sean on where, where the status is on that. That would be great, and if yep. it could be electric plug-in. Right. We had a long meeting where I kept talking about plug-in cars this morning, y'all, and Paul's sick of me saying plug-in cars. But um, yeah, it'd be great to see that down on the five-year plan, and maybe Andy has a good answer for me too, yep. or he's going to tell me to stop talking about plug-in cars. I don't know. Andy, your turn. Uh, actually, I was thinking of a different topic uh, since you were talking about vehicles. So, uh, but I, it, it is something that needs to uh, come to JCPC uh, because it's, if it's not on the list of things to consider, it doesn't make it onto a long-term plan. Uh, the other thing is about the building. Um, I think that this has been very helpful and uh, Dorothy, when we write the report for the next meeting, I think that it's important to uh, present some of this information and possibly include the slide deck if everybody is agreeable to that as an um, appendix to the report, right. because I think it speaks to itself. Uh, you know, the reality is, and I think that we all know it, that we've already have a council policy of making a commitment to four projects for capital buildings, the library, the elementary school, fire station, and the PW facility, which are all um, long-term needs. But, you know, I've been involved from the old finance committee to the select board to the council for a long time. And the senior center has been out there as sort of like one of the next things. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have had very strong statements of support for um, a youth center. And it has been presented by a couple of committees. And uh, I'm not trying to put and I sort of hate to even see competition between those two projects, but um, I think that it is important through this presentation and our report to the council to at least put the senior center there so that the council is aware that there's um, multiple requests to be next on the list and um, the senior center is in fact one of them and has been asking for many, many years that I know from my own experience that I just described. Yep, it's useful. Uh, Rosemary. Yes, you're, you're right about that, Andy. Um, back in 2017, in actual fact, we were told at a meeting with um, Dave Zomack that we would be put on the capital projects list, the 10 year capital projects list. And I, I thought that was had already happened, but clearly not. Do you, do you remember that, Paul? Yeah, David doesn't have the same recollection that you have, Rosemary. I've asked him about that specifically. Because we had, it was in all of our notes. Yeah. Uh, so he, he again, I asked him about that because I, I know you have, I trust your memory, um, but he does not recall that. Nor do I recall from the select board side and the uh, finance committee side from before having seen any 
um, actual list for next projects. I think that it was more that we were just aware of it through discussions and presentations that the need was there and had been presented on numerous occasions. But I'm not sure that any official body, either executive or uh, legislative within the town, had taken action to create a list and um, endless policy and something. I certainly don't recall anything. Okay. So the question of the list is something that we will talk about. Um, Shalini. And this, what I'm proposing is no way in lieu of a senior center, but we know it's not happening in the near future. And maybe we will find a location in the near future, so I'm hopeful. So I will remove that. Yeah, okay, I'm hopeful. And meanwhile, are, is there a space in the Jones Library? I haven't looked at the plan, which is designated, you know, just the way we're thinking of a teen space. Are we thinking of a space for seniors in the library? Paul, you no, I mean, not not a senior center for sure. I mean, there's not no, center, not center. Yeah, I, I don't know about a separate senior space that I mean, we have not discussed that as, as a member of the uh, Jones Library yeah. Building Committee. Um, but, you know, I think the point Andy made, and I think it's really important is that we need, you know, we are looking at lots of different, there are a lot of pieces moving. And this is I talked with Rosemary and Mr. Yorga as well. Um, so that's why it's so important for this seat, the Council on Aging this in the friends of the senior center to be out there here saying what they need because as we start looking at things and we know there's a need for this a teen center you know they're they're moving pieces hickory ridge there's you know there's we need to you know, south amherst school for instance is something that we could say well what about that for you know let's look at different options available to folks um so we as we look at all the needs that are piling up in front of the town we look at the resources we have and try to line them up and sort of um sometimes some things come to together fortuitously and we say ah this fits here and let's move on it but i think the first thing is to get a group together to start studying this um and pr i'm prepared to work on that with with the senior director right um in their discussion of what they wanted in the building, one story, lots of light. Um, I thought, did think of a good group that could be co-located, and this has been mentioned by other people, um, early childhood. Um, you know, a new building which does not have stairs to it, you know, beautiful stairs, but it's a very, very easy access that would be suitable for young and old. And that would, I think Haley had said that she was interested in some intergenerational projects and had, had thought of that, but I'm not, I'm not sure, could you? Comment on that, Haley? Yeah, I, um, intergenerational is really important, but uh, it's also important that we have a distinct space. So, you know, most seniors, I would say, like intergenerational programs. They enjoy being around, um, you know, high schoolers, elementary school students, but not every senior does. And so it is really important to to not have, you know, a community intergenerational center. It really has to be senior focused, but we can have you know, the elementary school students come in, we can have UMass students come in, we can certainly have those types of programs, but the space itself has to be dedicated to seniors. That's uh, probably the most important piece. Thank you, that's that. That's mm -hmm. clarification that I needed because lots of people are putting forward ideas and writing letters, and it's important to have your view on that. Absolutely, well, it's, it's really distinct, um, you know, need sets, you know, going back to pull cords in the bathroom, handrails, making sure that it's easy to navigate the space, you know, the the, experiences that we have as we get older are so drastically different from when we're younger that it, you know again just separate spaces okay so i think we're going to wind up the comment i i do want to make one final comment i loved it when george said he'd been retired for 20 years and i thought about it and actually i've been retired from my last real formal job for 20 years and the point is i might be here for another 20. seniors live a long time and it's a long process and we really are a very important part of the population. One of the advantages of seniors as taxpayers is that they no longer make use of the schools. They don't use that many services. They do use EMS, and they would love to use a wonderful senior center. Um, and it was interesting to hear, I hadn't heard the facts, that Pioneer Valley is becoming a um, desirable retirement place for seniors. That, that's interesting. Now, I knew the college towns grew intellectually active seniors. <laughs> Okay, so I want to thank very much uh, Haley and Rosemary for coming in, and um, we should then, um, it's 
seven thirty. Um, have we? Do we have a need for further discussion amongst yourself before we have the uh, CPOs discuss, or should we go forward in with the uh, next topic? Jalani, yes. I just wanted to uh, make sure we're all on the same page about the next step. So I heard Paul say that you're going to work with Haley with around the feasibility study. Was it like I didn't hear which study it was the feasibility study? Or what was it? Well, we would have to put a, together a presentation, a request for funds for a feasibility study. But I think what we want to do is start to get a, a group together to start looking at the need for it. And I think that's already formed, actually, mm, just okay. sort of more formalizing it is what I think we were talking about. Okay, and at our end at the town council, we're going to include the presentation in the in our in the in Dorothy prepares the summary. And what was the other thing, Andy? Some we have to get this put on the capital <laughs> projects list. Who does that and when? So the mm -hmm. department head typically submits a request for capital projects at the during the JCPC process. Okay. Okay. So you're saying that Haley can make that request? Is that correct? Okay, so Shalini, I really appreciate your attempt to sum up uh, the action items here. So you're saying, uh, Paul, you're saying that you're going to be responsible for working with the groups that exist now. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and that the department head will ask for the van. And are there? Um, I know that we've we've talked about looking at the site at Hickory Ridge. Um, for many, many different purposes. And you mentioned the the Southeast School too. Not the Southeast. I, I just use those as examples of spaces that are becoming available that we look for opportunities and, and, and timeliness, right? Okay. So, in, in, but in terms of what Shalini was asking, have we firmed up what the next steps are? Or is there something more that we need to do? I think we just said them. Okay, great. Okay, wonderful. All right. So. Um, does the group now want to go on to the um, CPO's presentation? Thank you, Haley and Rosemary. Yeah, thank, thank you for having you. me. Yes, thank you, Haley and Rosemary. Yes, bye. Everybody, really thank you, but I, I'm glad you, you stayed around. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, so I don't know with um, these three powerful people, I really don't know who I am asking is leading it, but I'm, maybe it's Angela, how about that? Um, we'll see. We're all set to hear you. Okay, just give us one moment to share our screen. And since there's three of us, I would just maybe ask our kind, whoever has the hosting capability to perhaps spotlight the three of us while we're speaking, if possible. Mm, it's not me. <laughs> I'm happy to do it, Dorothy, if you wanna make me a co-host. I don't know how to do that, my dear. Okay. I don't Athena's, Athena has that capability. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, and now that I lost you, can can everybody see our slides? I don't see Jennifer yet. Yes. See the yes. slides. Don't see Jennifer's yes. face. The slides. There, there she you is. go. Hello. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Set to go. So I will ask uh, before we give introductions and launch, I'll just ask that my fellow colleagues here um, unmute themselves so that we are gonna kind of go through our slides and you'll be able to experience three people trying to give you information all at once. So hopefully it's not too jarring. Um, so let's get right into introductions for those of us who don't um, know us and I'll go back to that slide. So here on your screen, uh, you'll see your community participation officer team. You'll hear that abbreviation for the rest of the night, CPO for the sake of, um, having it roll off the tongue a little quicker, but that's what it stands for. And we three were appointed by your town manager, Paul Balkoman, um, at the end of December in 2018. So I'm going to ask Angela and Jennifer to introduce themselves first, and then I'll say hello. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? It's Angela. Yes. I just want to thank Brianna for pulling together this slide presentation. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to say, I've really enjoyed working with these two women and I've learned so much from both of them. And we are delighted to be with you tonight. And just, you know, to throw out there that there's no reason this can't be fun, right? <laughs> thank you, Angela. Love Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself to our Sure, great. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having us. 
And um, similar to Angela, it's really nice to work with Abri and Angela um, as CPOs because I think that we all have our own connections as well as overlapping connections to reach out into the community to kind of help uh, bring the community into local government. So it's, I think it's always fun, Angela. What are you talking about? <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. And my name is Brianna. I've worked for the town um, for almost seven years now. Prior to that, I worked for the city of Worcester, almost exclusively working in uh, the local government space of technology and communications. So um, for anybody who didn't know us well, hopefully that helps a little bit. I am going to backtrack just a little. I, I said earlier um, quickly what CPO stood for. Um, oh, let me see if I can't go backwards, I'm sorry. Just a second. Okay. So we, we, we talked a little bit about what community participation officer um, CPO stood for. Um, I won't read all of this, but I wanted to give a little context to how the three of us came to, to this work in the end of 2018. And it really came from the Amherst Home Road Charter um, that was updated that changed our form of government. So uh, just some quick points here about the, the language from the charter that created the committed community participation officer and what the goals um, that were highlighted within that document. You'll see us talking a little bit about some of these goals and further in the presentation, we'll talk about um, some of our goals and maybe and re-envisioning or expanding of some of the things that are um, put in the actual charter itself. So, a little a little quickly and then I'm going to invite my colleagues to kind of share some of their thoughts as we go through we thought it worth um, talking about a, a little bit about what we bring to the work um, in addition to our professional skills and our experience in local government we all have um, children in the Amherst public schools we all live in town some of us grew up here in town and are very Amherst um, we went to and some of us currently attend uh, UMass Amherst some of us went to Amherst College. We all are in the local dog scene for Amherst. Some of us are fluent in Spanish. Some of us are coaches. And we all serve um, in other capacities within our community um, on nonprofit boards. And some of those are listed here. We thought that was important to, to mention. So now we'll kind of talk about a little bit of some of the things that operationally we have um, done to try to meet some of those goals that we looked at earlier from the charter. So I would invite Angela to kind of go through some of these. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, of course. Sure, so we had lots of fun um, planning the first and the subsequent inauguration of the town council. Um, I had a great time with my colleagues planning for the state of the town events. And that includes coverage by Amherst Media. Um, and, and we learned so much from doing both of those, just what it means to do a minute by minute TikTok of an event and how to make sure that things flow smoothly. And we were really lucky at the very first inauguration to have help from Tony Maroulis, who is an expert at things like developing a TikTok and making sure that we pick the right people to be MCs. Um, and then Brianna's been stellar at hosting the coffee meetups with the town manager, both in person and as we switch to virtual format during the pandemic. Um, town manager office hours are something that um, I think we have learned that people enjoy attending and, um, and we're definitely looking at new ways to revamp those. Capital planning listening sessions. I think with the great format and the great tools that we have online, those are becoming more and more interactive. And then with district meetings, we continue to work with town councilors to find the best way to meet their needs. And I hope that you find us um, to be good listeners and also to be good sports about changing different formats and trying new things. I know District 5 integrated some of the UMass tools for participation. And so we're open to new ideas and we hope to help you innovate those district meetings as we try hybrid format and as we move towards um, in-person things happening soon, hopefully. Budget forums, everybody loves budget forums. I can't say enough about them. 
And um, our two community cleanups have been really successful. Um, the photo that you see on this slide is from the very first one that we hosted in 2018. And then we just hosted one a couple of weekends ago and we had so many great volunteers from so many different areas and community partners from UMass and community partners from Amherst College and all of our great community members. So we can't say thank you enough for that. We filled three dumpsters to the brim and um, we found some really interesting items, <laughs> but the most plentiful of course were the nip bottles. So we'll continue to work on that. And City Hall Selfie Day, that's a, that's a Brianna special, I think. <laughs> um, Brianna kind of picks the day and we all try and look our best. And city, Sister City, we are still sister cities with Kanagasaki in Japan. And we just recently hosted a group of students from Senegal. Um, and that was a very interesting exchange in the town room. We learned so many um, things that, that are similar and different from them. And they asked some really good questions. And then we've been fortunate to host representatives from the Attorney General's office for an open meeting law seminar, which is important for people who are new to boards, committees, and commissions. But we also reached out to the AG's office and they sent a representative to teach us about um, pranksters and spamming of our seniors and how lots of things that are sent to them in the mail are asking them to share very personal information items and leads to kind of this waterfall effect of um, identification stealing. So we've been really fortunate and partnering with the Commonwealth and they've been great about sending us knowledgeable people to host those different events. And we hope to continue those in the future. Great, thank you, Angela. So I'll talk quickly about this and then I'm gonna invite give Jenna, Jenna heads up um, to, to talk about what we're gonna move on to next. So some of the, the local events and groups that we've worked with, um, the Survival Center and promoting their information and their events and hosting um, a team lunch there to meet and greet the community members as uh, CPOs. Uh, we did more of that pre-pandemic, which we'll, you'll kind of see as a theme here. Um, you know, guests at Cup of Joe's uh, with Paul in the community chat events, we try to bring different department heads around to meet community members directly or different stakeholders, uh, representatives from UMass, from our business community to kind of make those um, cross stakeholder connections. We did some um, great work. One of the first things that we did back in person was the Hickory Ridge um, discover that property where we had um, hundreds of community members come out and learn about uh, that property and share their ideas with it for the future. But we also table regularly, again, at the Survival Center, the first day celebration and different ARPS events, uh, the annual block party when we have them, the sustainability festival, the, mo the mobile market, and visiting um, some of the area Amherst complexes. So um, I'd like to invite Jen to talk about some of our flag raisings and cultural events and the, the, all the work that goes into that and the supporting of those events, especially uh, through her intersection with the work in DEI that she's doing. Right, so one of the ways that I have seen, or I think that we've all seen that we can get community members to, that we don't usually hear from is by celebrating the many different cultural uh, heritages that are in within our community. And so I think this year for Black History Month, our online and our in-person flag raising probably had the most amount of folks. You know, we do flag raising for Arbor Month, Race Amity Day, the Puerto Rican Heritage Day, we help support the school system there. The Free Tibetan Day as well. Um, the Pride LGBTQA+. Um, Indian Pakistan 75th Independence Day was our first last year. And one of the things that we heard several members or community members state was it was nice to see that their culture was being celebrated by the town. Uh, Juneteenth, we're rolling into our, our second full year of celebration of Juneteenth, a grand opening of the Riders Walk, Lunar New Year, which is a newer um, event that we've been hosting, and Martin Luther King Day celebration, which is a, it's different than the one at the school, although we do help support the breakfast at the school, but I always have to note that the MLK 
um, breakfast committee does a wonderful job with their breakfast. We just also feel that the town itself has an obligation to help celebrate the, that day as well. Um, we celebrate Human Rights Day, multilingual heritage celebration on the common. I, there's the list is getting longer and longer, and um, you know I know just this year too we had. Uh, Autism, Autism Awareness Month celebration, and we will be doing a Asian American Pacific Islander heritage celebration later next week. And so our list just keeps growing. And so we do ask that the community members to submit um, proclamations or requests or ideas, you know, we had a former community safety working group member reach out to have some support with an event that they were hosting a couple of weeks ago. And so it is really a great way. And I think we all feel very honored when we can help and support uh, the different celebrations that happen in town. Excellent. Thank you, Jen. I guess this one um, will fall to me. So I can talk a little bit some, about some of the new systems and technology we've brought online recently. And really this is just in addition to the um, multiple tools and channels we have to share information. I'll go through some of those quickly, just as an example, um, our, our multiple websites, our uh, social media channels. We have um, many, many different levels of information that you can subscribe to to get things right into your inbox quickly, easily, or into your um, a text message. So we could probably do a whole session about all the different ways um, you can stay in touch, you know, subscribing to all of them or getting granular down to the level of just wanting to hear um, everything on the council calendar, for example. Some new things that we brought online in the last year or so were our dedicated public participation platform, Engage Amherst, um, another, another tool that's kind of in space in our downtown area are our SUFA signs. So not only are we pushing information in ways to engage our community calendar are on those signs, we also allow for residents to answer our prompts that we put up there as questions. So sometimes we'll get um, people catch passersby who might not be connected to us in any other way, responding to the prompt of what they wanna see at Hickory Ridge or what they're looking forward to most this summer in Amherst or just easy ways to, to capture and interact. Um, and we are trying to expand our research collaboration with the university by offering some of their tools, uh, learning from some of their expertise, and just having um, a really good relationship with a team of top-notch research researchers right in our backyard. So we're looking to kind of expand that as well. All right, so Angela's gonna come back and talk to you a little bit about what the pandemic kind of did to what we were doing um, and we're getting greater successes on doing before the pandemic hit. So go ahead, Ange. So I think like all of us, the pandemic took us by surprise and um, kudos to Brianna for working with the health department and working with the Commonwealth and with Paul to make sure that our COVID website was robust. Um, we made an effort in our office to make sure that our phones were fully staffed so that when people were calling town hall, they were getting an actual live person. Um, we tried to keep people updated on mask initiatives. We work hand in hand with the Amherst ambassadors and helped them in lots of different ways to make sure that they were on message, boots on the ground, um, helping people understand the mask mandates downtown and how they changed over the course of the first 18 months. Um, we offered public meeting support and that's still going on. Um, we're learning ways to, like I said, support district meetings and support um, lots of different boards and committees and commissions as we all try and stay safe during the pandemic. Virtual community events, we learn by doing, I think. I think we got better and better at making sure that we didn't get Zoom bombed. Um, it wasn't pleasant, but we learned a lot from those experiences. And, um, and then all three of us were really kind of instrumental in working with the health department to make sure that chairs were set up at um, vaccine clinics to make sure that we had people um, guiding people towards the entrance. And once again, we learned by doing. It wasn't perfect the first time we hosted our first vaccine clinic, but I feel like it did get better and better. And we had wonderful helping hands from people like facilities managers and people at the schools 
and um, and we all kind of pulled together to make sure that we tried to meet the needs of the community. So I was really proud of that effort. Um, during that time, as we looked to our most vulnerable population, the people who are un unhoused, I was astounded by the amount of collaboration between so many different departments and from the Commonwealth at um, the way that we tried to stand up a quarantine center for our, our, our homeless population at Hampshire College. So kudos to us for thinking of taking care of the most vulnerable population during that time. Luckily, it, it didn't have to be put into action, but the plan that we came up with was really solid. So that's one of my lasting memories from the pandemic and something that I feel like if we can do that, then there are so many other great things that we can do together. Jen, did you have any um, thoughts that you wanted to share on, on this piece or? Yeah, I think I can just say, I know that um, the community also really stepped up in sewing and donating um, supplies to make masks at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so that was really important. And I worked with one of the counselors here to kind of to start that. And But I really, it was pretty amazing in the amount of community members who stepped up to sew masks, to donate materials for masks, because at that time, at the very beginning, you couldn't get any masks anywhere. So I think that was another really big um, pivot point at the pandemic was that community uh, helping each other. Yeah, I'm really supporting glad you, each other. Yeah, I'm really glad you decided to to mention that because it really isn't um, wasn't just work that the town was doing. Um, we were working side by side with some of our partners, especially in the community. And I I had had one thing to share in while we're in this space is that by doing some of these things, by recording all of our meetings, by offering um, an easy way for our community members to join into a, a coffee chat or a town council meeting we really started to see um, participation increase in ways that we had never before. And we had an easy way to, um, through that data and the analytics through some of these platforms that we're using, we actually had real numbers that we could use for one of the first times um, since we started to do this work. And I think through that we've gained, we made so many gains that now as we try to re-enter these um, you know, back to the bricks and mortar, so to speak, is really how we can continue that and make it sustainable so that we don't lose out any of, um, of that kind of steam that we gained over the last two years. Okay, so these are just be quick. I know that we probably wanna get into some questions. Um, you know, looking ahead, we are going to talk a little bit about identify, identifying some challenges and limitations we've noted over time. Um, one of the things that we're looking to do is discover and connect with more community partners. We've done a really good job about cataloging, cataloging who those people are, but we're obviously, um, that list is never complete. So we're looking to make sure that it's as complete as possible. Um, and something we think would be really helpful um, as a team is to outline goals and plans for the future and kind of come off of that charter page a little bit more and kind of make um, some more actionable goals that can be measured and really kind of jump off that page of what's been put into the charter and, and see what the community needs and what our leadership and what our elected officials um, would like to see and kind of put that into uh, an operation plan. Does my team want me to just run through the rest here? Thumbs up? Okay. Um, so again, future goals, one of the things we've noticed, um, especially through the last few years, we've used a lot of technology that had built in language translation, which was great, right, because we know that there's needs there, um, but it's not enough. So we want to expand uh, language access for our community members and really I identifying what our needs are and putting a combination of things in place, whether it's through technology or people or um, other skills or organizations that we can tap into to expand um, the language justice in the town. I mentioned this earlier, but redefining the scope of our work and finding an accurate way to measure our success. One of the stipulations in the charter is to analyze data on, on resident engagement. And so we really wanna know what that means, put in place things that we can measure so we can see our progress over time. 
And one of the things we want to do kind of as a core tenant is invite people to learn more about local government via civic education seminars or opportunities um, and really create some rungs on that ladder of community engagement so people can feel comfortable um, not only getting involved, but knowing that they can get involved. So now to everybody's favorite part, and again, I'll, I'll read this, but I invite my team members to kind of pop in and um, add anything that I don't articulate extremely well at the moment. So challenges, um, I'm sure many of you can relate to, to some of these challenges. They're not unique to our town or to our team, but some things that we've noticed over the last um, few years of doing this work, we, we hope to bring to your attention, um, just overall resources and staff capacity. You know, do we have um, a budget to, to put in place some of the things that we um, want to do? What's the capacity of our existing staff in order to kind of scale up and scale out and do that in a sustainable way? Language we mentioned earlier, the general mistrust of government, big and small. That's a, that's a very big problem that needs um, big solutions and that needs to be solved um, beyond just our team of three. And the something that we we wanted to mention because it's been on everybody's minds, but just the scale and scope of the larger projects that we have going on and all of the outreach and engagement requirements that go along with them, the library, the schools, and um, being able to support those efforts as best as possible, but again, having that be sustainable for our team. All right, we're coming to the end, I promise. So what's next? Uh, we want to continue to build community pride through good works, continue and um, further collaborations with ARPS, BID, Chamber, our ambassadors. Again, that, that list that's not exhaustive, we want to um, continue those collaborations to scale our work and redefine what the stewardship piece of the work means. So, before um, we flip it back over to questions, I just wanna invite Jen and Angela to kind of put any other last thoughts that they want to share that I may have missed. Jen, do you wanna go first? No, please go. I'm a little distracted because my dog has something he shouldn't have. So <laughs> I'm just trying to get to him. So uh, I think one of the conversations we have up on the mezzanine as CPOs often is outreach means different things to different people. And so when we say, you know, you're responsible for outreach um, to everyone in our community, that word has, has, has significant meaning, but is, is a word that is kind of heavy with meaning. So we are trying our best to meet people's expectations on the term outreach, but we need to hear from the community kind of what outreach means to them, and that will better help us do the work. Okay, so Councillor Pam. Oh, oh I'm okay. here. I just, I also want to say too, like, when it comes to community participation, it's kind of, I'm always, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't have my headset on, sorry. So, um, you know, not everybody wants to be on a board or committee. So it's how do we continuously get people to still be involved with local government or with the town without necessarily being on a board or committee, even though that their their voices and their thoughts are so important to the decision making and, and we need that to influence how we make decisions. So it's a struggle and it can really be a struggle. I, I have a question comment. Um, before COVID, you were having uh, outreach events at various um, housing complexes in town. And I went on as many of them as I could, and I really loved them because there was no other way for me to get to know that area. So they, none of them are in my district, but you know I serve not just my district, but the town. It really helped me understand the town more. So, um, and they were all outdoors, which means they could take place even though we're in a COVID situation again. Um, I, do you plan to do more of those this summer, this spring? That's my question. Oh, can I go, can I go? No, so Miss um, Dorothy Pam, we have a whole series. Um, sometimes 
connecting with the apartment complex and getting the word from the upper management, it takes a little bit more time than we would hope. But we do have a series of um, events where we'll be introducing Crest. And so at the same time that we will be inter introducing Crest to the apartment, to folks in these neighborhoods, we will also be asking, you know, it's a town-wide initiative and we have so many initiatives. So we will be asking folks from the library to attend. The counselors are always um, asked to come. And I'm glad that you enjoyed going to the different places and neighborhoods to um, meeting folks. So yeah, that's great. And, and I would just love more, I see, sometimes we, we thought we could go to the farmer's market and sit and talk to people. But when you check out where they're from, most of the people at the farmer's market don't live in Amherst. So it was really a wonderful opportunity just to engage in casual conversation and to learn things. So I do appreciate that. Um, Shalini. Yeah, well, thank you all so much for uh, everything you all are doing. And it's always fun to engage with you all. And that's one thing I really do want to appreciate is the really positive energy that I always had, no matter when or what uh, time of the day it is and what we're talking about. All three of you have been so um, willing to help and find a solution. So yay, you all. Uh, my question now is, uh, in terms of as we are thinking about expanding community engagement to uh, different stakeholders in our community, uh, and I think Jennifer already alluded to that, that many people are not connected with the issues that are happening, but they impact them. And sometimes after the fact, we hear like, oh, we weren't informed. And, and so and I know that we like we are relying on you, the community participate or town's office. I don't know who in, but we're. I mean, it's a town manager's uh, uh, responsibility to do the outreach. So, my question was, when we are working on certain issues, like town services right now is working with on water and uh, sewer bylaw. And we want to reach out to uh, different community um, people who are impacted by that. So w what would that look like? Like, when do we communicate that with you? And who do we communicate with so that and then where would you go about putting that information out so more people hear about it? And do you have lists of stakeholders like you know, we're doing rental registration, so that impacts uh, renters, uh, students, landlords, business owners. So it's like, do you have lists of people that, so if we are working on something, we come, you know, whoever we go to and we like, okay, we need this to be sent out to this, this, this group, would you have the capacity to then send it out and how will it be sent out? I don't know. I think there were 10 different questions in that. So, Marie, do you want to, do you, um, I think the three of us have been pretty heavily involved with the Age and Dementia Survey that is uh -huh. the most recent kind of town-wide project of this scope. Yeah. And, and Bree, do you want to talk about how you've been involved? And Jen, do you want to talk about how you've been involved? And we can kind of tackle it three prong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's a really great question, Counselor. Thank you. So, um, we do have, I don't want to say that we've got like a binder full of stakeholders or whatever mm -hmm. the, 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 the meme is, but we do, mm -hmm. um, for example, I know leading up to the inauguration, um, this team and Angela put together a very extensive list of stakeholders, like who should we invite, who should they be there just to kind of, mm -hmm. and almost think of it as a community mapping exercise and really kind of peeling up and thing, oh, did you think of this group? So we certainly have um, lists like that. And when it comes to being able to communicate, we do have contacts within those groups. Um, and I mentioned a part, one of the slides about the, the tools and technology we have for lots of people to subscribe to things, right? But it's really an opt-in. Um, you know, because of best practice, we have a methods where people can opt in to our information, but that's not like we can't end there. Um, so we do have lists of stakeholders. We have lists of the um, apartment living communities and how many people live there and who's the manager at that property because a lot of times we have to seek permission before we can go give them flyers because we can't just um, 
drop things off like that. So it really depends on the audience. Oftentimes we'll have an individual relationship with somebody in an organization or at the school where the pipeline's really smooth to make a communication or send a flyer or do a request. And sometimes it's more boots on the ground. Can we put this up here? Um, could we share this with you? And in some things we do just as a matter of course is, you know, making sure it's on our website, making sure it's on our calendar, making sure it's on all our different channels that we use for regular communications first so that we can refer new people back to those um, pieces of information. And I'll just say quickly, we do um, sometimes it feels like a uh, like an internal consultant group, the CPO team, we will get requests coming from the planning department who's about to do an initiative on X, Y, or Z or the age and dementia friendly community survey. And they'll approach us and say, this is our plan. Um, could you help us get the word out about this? And what will that look like? And we'll talk about kind of the buffet of options that we have available to us. And if they'll tell us that, you know, we really need to get this into the hands of seniors from X age and up, that gives us more information, helps us help them better get into that community. So I, th I think that would be my, response there. I, hopefully I answered your questions. Can I ask a follow-up question? Oh, okay. So, yes. and, and Paul then would, like, so like I said, like the rental registration, we want people to know that we're discussing this and we want them to look at it and get feedback. So would we send it to you, Paul, that Hey, can you send this out to all the land because I'm sending out randomly like to six people I know who are landlords and renters, but like I would want it to go to butternut or all of these built apartments and and to have the people, you know, systematically be sent out to the landlords and the renters and then students and get like maybe send it out to Tony so he can then find the right group to send it out to students so. So would I would we send like let's say if CRC is working on that would we send it to yeah so I, I think with CRC for instance you'd work with Dave who is the, the staff contact there uh -huh. and say we would like this distributed and I think as Bree said the more specific you can say is to the audience mm -hmm. you want it to hit because there are yeah. different audiences and different ways to hit it um, right. we don't spam people we don't just send things randomly we do it very targeted and we. Right because we we do have a lot of information that we do not utilize you know we're not going to send right. everything to everybody so um i think it's also at a certain point it's about staff capacity uh these three women are incredibly talented and dedicated but they also have a lot they have other jobs too and that's one of the, one of the miracles of this mm -hmm. is that we've gotten i mean that, i'm gonna say they're just they're doing a lot already and so mm -hmm. and, and so i leave it to them to sort of judge how what they can take on what they can't because they're out weekends and nights already anyway yeah and yeah, like you're here right now at eight o'clock. Um, but then sh could we get the list? Like if, you know, like if I'm working with, you know, in, I'm just envisioning because we're working out our community engagement from the town council side. So I'm wondering like if in each committee, like in TSO, I don't mind being the designated person who's looking into coordinating that. So would it be preferred if the committee then sends out the emails? I guess we have to look at it case by case, understand what you're really what you're what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, as as I think Angela or Brianna said, that a lot of it is just personal communicate is personal relationships that people have developed mm -hmm. because they're also integrated into, into the community. So I think we, you identify the topic mm -hmm. and what you want to do, identify yeah. what needs to be done, and then we try to support you with that. Right. And I think there's that thing of building the relationship. So let's say the TSO can build a relationship with the sort of um, stakeholders we think we're going to be working with. And, you know, like even the racial equity groups or whatever, because we want the groups that already exist to then reach out to their members. Right. And, and it's a two way street. You know, I just sent you something yesterday, I think, asking you to help to spread the word about new yeah. district voting areas because yes. you have each of you has your own extensive list as well so exactly. you know if it's a town thing and and you can choose to do it or not but yeah. um that there there's a lot of different ways both sides are doing the same work and in, in collaboration yes thank you for pointing that out because yeah. that's the other thing i was going to say that if you all have events that you all want the cpos or in town then let all the council know so that we can then send it out 
to in our because most of us have newsletters or we do district meetings where we can then share it out as well. So I have more questions, but I'll wait. Okay, I Thank just you. lost my picture here, um, but I know that uh, Anika has her hand up. I mean, I'm still trying to get my picture back. Uh, maybe Brianna. I didn't know if Brianna had her hand up to answer a question, so I'm happy with Brianna going ahead. Okay, great. I, I did had a follow up to the Councillor uh, Balmilne's question. If you'd still want me to go, I'll share it. Yeah. Uh, we we try to protect um, our promise to the public on when they share information to us and what they sign up for. That we, for example, with the rental registration, we promise those individuals that their information would be to contact them for permitting or, or things of that nature. And so I think if we're asked to access those um, pieces of information that it just needs to be super relevant and in a way that fits in with that original promise. Um, so that's something that we, we take very seriously when it comes to communication, like formal official communications from the town. Um, you'll probably, you probably heard me say that a few times, but it is something we, we value and we take very seriously. And we we'll work yeah. in, with, within that system to, to share that information appropriately. Oh, absolutely. I don't mean that if you have a list for a different purpose, to use it for a totally different purpose would be completely an invasion of privacy. So I didn't. And, and so I think we need to then build a list. Maybe the committees need to build. I don't know. And that's what the dialogue is that who's going to build that list with the stakeholders for the purpose of community engagement, that if a council is working on these issues and we want to inform and get feedback and let people know about these projects, do we have your permission as a faith organization, as a you know, racial equity task force or all these uh, different groups, do we have permission to reach out to you for those purposes? So I just want to jump in on that one because mm -hmm. we have to be very careful if the council acts we support individual counselors, you know, because we we don't want to break any campaign laws or anything like that, and that's that, there's a danger with that. Um, so we, if the council is taking an action or saying we need this, then or a committee, we can we can support that. But individual counselors saying I really want to know about mm. this, that's not what we can help you with. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I have no interest in reaching out to people on my personal, but in terms of like as I'm creating the community engagement plan. Uh, the idea would be that each committee would be appointing perhaps, and this all has to be vetted, I'm just hypothesizing, but uh, but the idea would be that TSO wants to reach out, right? Right now we're getting uh, residents tell, uh, you know, asking us to go and uh, let people know about the water and sewer um, bylaw and the, the impact of blah, blah, blah. So things like that or the crc is working on rental registration so then the committee it's not the individual counselor but the committee wanting feedback so yeah um i would like to um it's i know we're in the middle of a discussion but it's 10 after 8. i would like to have a five minute break um is that can a possibility anika, can anika ask her question so that way the C cpos can go after probably so they don't have to wait around for a break in that case. Very good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to take a minute to give praise and comment um, to these three. Um, I know myself, um, you know, coming, returning to the area, it was, you know, really because of the three of you that I became engaged with community and then, you know, um, interested in, in town council. And I just through that experience, I really can't imagine, especially TSO not coordinating um, with you all. I know I've had amazing experiences and, you know, having visions that I have, you know, come to life. Um, and, you know, uh, and a Angela was so helpful in really, you know, starting getting me through our first district meeting and run up fun with a webinar. And, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's just so much that comes out of you three. So I'm really appreciative of that. And, um, yeah, within, um, of course, within what is sustainable and what is your time. Also, I want to ask that we've had, you know, also great help going on with the Jones Library Building Committee, um, you know, outreach. So, I mean, I think to Paul's point, um, this is a collaborative effort. Like we do have, 
you know, we have something sent to us and we'll, as counselors, have range within our networks. Um, and so I think whether that's through our, our social media, our mailing list, collaborating together, I mean, just the potential is is huge. Um, and I think especially throughout, you know, bringing out that, oh, and outreach, which everyone in the community really seems to want. So thank you all so much. And thank you for that presentation. Thank you, Nika, very nicely said. Uh, so I would just, my last little word is that, um, as Paul knows, we just received a nice thank you for Angela's quick and enthusiastic response to uh, the paperwork for a block party. And yes, the time uh, was not uh, was not quite within the two weeks thing, but she, she got it done instantly and um, connected them with the uh, police department for the sawhorses within the road and all the rules. So it was done so quickly, so nicely, and so cheerfully that the people are happy. So that's really what we like. Um, outreach that serves the community and makes them feel uh, happy while they do it. So we really appreciated your input today and we may ask you for more questions later, uh, but um, yeah, now Shalini, can, can I hold your question till after the break or did you wanna speak? Uh, I can send my questions to them afterwards, but I also actually needed to ask to uh, be able to leave because I'm in Florida. And so if it's okay, I will also not return back after, unless there's something really urgent that we're discussing. We're going to talk about uh, future agenda items. We have to do the minutes. We have an appointment. Uh, we can put mm. you in the circle and it loop you in later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. Okay. So we're having a brief five minute break and, um, the time on my watch is 8.15. We'll be back here at 8.20. So please turn your video off. And Dorothy, and Dorothy are, are the CPO officers? Yes. Oh, I thought that that was already said earlier okay. by someone else. I didn't think I had to repeat it. Thank you for being here. And yes, Thank you may. You. Thank you. Thank you. rest of your evening. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.
Someone's missed the chair. <laughs> yeah. We are still recording. I know, it's fine. I've, I've probably done worse things on the recording. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, we have to have breaks because I get up and I can't walk. I'm so sick. I'm sitting here for an hour and a half. Um, I never sit anywhere for an hour and a half. Oh. Gotta get a standing desk. All right, I'm ready. I'm focused again. Can't do that either. Uh, so, okay. Um, getting back to our agenda, um, we're still in the discussion, and um, I think, um, has, does anyone want to say anything else on the question of outreach, CPOs? Okay, then our next item um, is, uh, Paul is going to give us a brief comment on, we had speed limits on our agenda, and we knew that there was a question of uh, what's the word? Who's in charge of what? Um, and you're going to tell us some of that. Yes. Okay. I'm off. So yeah. So there, there was legislation passed uh, the Municipal Modernization Act that allows cities and towns to introduce 25 per mile per hour speed limits um, in territory contiguous to any way which is built up with structures devoted to business or the territory contiguous to any way where dwelling houses are situated at such distances as will average less than 200 feet between them for a distance of a quarter mile or more. Anyway, um, so and what so there's about 60 cities and towns have adopted this and makes it it just makes it sort of uh, citywide that it will be 25 miles an hour um, unless it's already posted a different speed. It doesn't um, sub you know take other speed you know if, if it's posted for 40 miles an hour that stays at 40 miles an hour you can't it doesn't override existing speed limits that have been posted many of our roads do not have posted speed limits right now so um and so what we can do i'm, I'm not sure where this initiative came from i think it was a council initiative um or if it's a counselor who's sponsoring it um, so originally it, there was it came a after there was a pedestrian accident at umass and there okay. were some proponents from the community Okay, so we can put together a. I'm sorry, Dorothy. I'm sorry. I think that was in our first year of of uh, town council. Okay, and so Angela did come, and a young man, a friend of the person who was killed, spoke, okay. and we've sort of had it floating around since then. So we can put together a memo, and I think doing it when Guilford is here is probably the wisest thing, which I think will probably be at your next meeting. Sort of that outlines what the opportunities are for that, um, and it's been done with, with many other communities. Um, and so we can sort of outline what actions need to be taken. So I just wanted to, it was on the agenda, so I wanted to address that a little bit. Okay, um, Anna. Uh, when that happens, is it simple enough to provide us with a map of which roads do not have posted speed limits? I think so. Okay. That'd be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I got very excited because I was like looking at how far away my neighbor's houses were through a little 25 mile an hour on Bay Road, but that probably won't happen because it's marked. Um, so it'd be really helpful to have a um, a map outlining which streets are not yep. posted. Thank you. Um, and a question, um, wouldn't this be something that we would talk the TAC about? Um, sure. I mean, that's the other topic that you has on your agenda is what is right. what's role do you want the TAC to play in items like this? And is, should they be? Yeah. So we can talk about that when they're here. Just to see if they have research on it. Um, Anika. Um, just to clarify, you may have covered this. So if there is a street that does not have a limit posted, mm -hmm. um, 
is there is that just like an assumed 25 mile an hour or can people go do whatever they like? well like right I'm not a driver so excuse my questions right right no right now the assumed is 30 miles an hour okay very good point thank you okay and anna i see your hand is still up it is i had another question so i mean i i'm stuck a little bit I'm not, I'm off of Bay Road, but um, we, I get a lot of calls from constituents about streets that are marked. And I know we're talking about this specific act, but could you talk about the process to, to work with our constituents if they feel their road is marked too fast? So the yeah. example, I get a lot of Shea Street. So the, they do a, if you, if there is a street like that, and this happened, I think uh, with Northeast Street as well, uh, the way, the, and I'm not the expert on it, but the way I understand it works is that they do a traffic study, they do a speed study, and they mark it at 80% of what the travel speed is. So it, um, unless there's some extenuating circumstance, like a, like a school being there or something like that. Um, so, um, and, and so they try to, a town can't just say, oh, we're making every road, you know, this road needs to be, you know, 10 miles an hour or anything like that. So they, there's, there's some rules about the that the state has but again i'm not the expert on that that we'd want our traffic engineer to talk about that and so okay fully not expecting you to have an answer to this either though so increased um increased building on the street increased residential on the street doesn't impact it at all as long as it's so okay now i am back to bay road um because the other end of not selfishly but the other end of bay road folks keep bringing up, you know, there's a lot of new houses down there on South Middle on and things like that. Um, and even in the past, you know, 20, 30 years, Bay Road has, um, has seen more houses go up, but the road itself is one of the oldest roads in Amherst. It's big and flat and, you know, um, it is the oldest road in Amherst. And so, yeah, I think that's right. So um, it, people go really fast. So 80% of the average speed might actually raise the speed limit um, mm -hmm. and projecting. So how do, maybe this is a question for Jason, but how do they factor that in if there's increased presence, residential presence on the street? It, it doesn't really impact it. It doesn't mm -hmm. at all. No. So okay. long roads are just going to be fast. No uh, matter yeah. I mean, unless it's thickly settled, which is a very, they, they is, you know, they, sometimes you'll see signs thickly settled and there's a definition of that. I don't think yeah. Bay Road is thickly settled. No, it's not. It's not. Okay, thank you. Um, I will follow up on that is, is there any way for a road like Bay Road to have its speed limit lowered? We'd have to do a study about it. Okay, so I I, I suspect that, that um, Anna, you've brought this up a number of times, that you think that perhaps a study should be made of Bay Road in terms of its not speed if it's, So that's what I was just asking, Dorothy, not if the study, I, honestly, not if, Sure, but if the study is the way that Paul outlined and it's based on driver speed, not based on any other factors other than like a school, which obviously doesn't apply, um, then no, it's not worth the money to, to do a study in my opinion, because I don't think it would change the speed limit. So I guess I had trouble following that argument that, that I mean, if people speed on a street and you go and you record that and then say, well, we're gonna lower the speed limit to 80% of what they're doing, that doesn't sound rational to me. And, and, and that is what I think you said all they would do that's i mean my, yeah i mean that's that's my understanding is that it's it everybody on a street wants everybody else to drive slowly on their street right and you can't hit and the i mean i think the state law is that not everybody can say you, everybody has to drive slowly in front of my house and so they have these sort of statewide rules so that everybody's playing by the same rules but and number it's, it's, yeah. So, and, and I think it's the, the the design of the road that defines how how what is a safe speed for someone to drive, not people's perceptions. Nor accidents, though. That was the other part. Accidents of can play into it. Yes. Okay. All right. Bay Road might have a shot. Yep. Okay. All right. So that you will formalize that because I know you know how to yep. do that. Good. Okay. Yes. Yep. I had a, a comment. So yeah, I I am on um on Chestnut Street and where this isn't something I've witnessed. Um, I've had quite a few emails that come in complaining about uh, accelerated speeds from some of the traffic coming, which is like coming, you know, passing the middle school um, oh. and then intersection with the high school. So I'm not sure um, had that been a complaint or even really so what is the, the limit on speed limit yeah. on Chestnut Street? 
So I think the first way that we address that is if there is a complaint, we get a number of complaints and um, Heather Stone is a, a road that we often get complaints on. And then what we do is we enforce, we put a track when we have available officers, we'll have someone sit up there and sort of you know, have a speed, you know, monitor speed and pull people over. What we often find is that it's residents of the road because those are the people who are going home, they need to get home fast or something. But, um, but that's the first order of business is to put in some directed patrols to say, sit up there for, you know, on different parts of, for a couple of weeks. And we've done that on Bay Road multiple times. Um, and to try to let people know that this is, we're, we're trying to slow traffic down. Mm -hmm. So the first, that's the first easy, we can do that right away thing, when, you know, if that's where we need to go. Okay. And if that, so if that's an area that you think is a concern, I can let the police chief know and he'll factor mm -hmm. that in. I mean, it might be worth looking at just because you do have, you know, especially at a certain time, there are like a ton of the students coming from middle school and, and even yeah. from high school. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, aren't there separate rules for school districts? School zones. School, school zones, zones, yeah. Yeah, school zones. Okay. Okay, Anna. Yeah, and I want to be fair. I know that speed limits aren't actually like speed limit signs aren't actually the necessarily the most effective way to stop speeding, right? And can sometimes make it more dangerous. I get that. Um, I think you know the other. This is it's it's probably one of the top things I have been hearing about. Right, I hear Bay Middle Station, uh, not Station Shays. Yeah, um, and so I, I think that it's. The other thing that might be helpful is to, if you're collecting things to ask Jason, um, mm -hmm. asking what else we can ask for. So mm -hmm. um, if we, you know, if we know that speed limits aren't going to necessarily make the difference or, you know, like on Bay Road, lowering it to 25 would actually probably be more dangerous because someone would come up really fast around a corner on someone who's going the speed limit. Um, so uh, what other measures we might be able to tell our constituents that we'll we'll try to get um, mm -hmm. in the, and beyond just patrols. I think that's they're great for the week that they're there. They slow them for an, an area and they go away. But what else can we talk about? What are the price? What's the cost of those flashing signs? Have we ever looked into automated ticket or automatic ticketing? Um, I meant to send you a really fascinating article I read about New York um, uh, about that recently, but I'd love to hear more just generally about what our other options might be. Sure. I, mean, I think that the, the most effective thing is our design, instituting design constraints. So what that means, narrowing roads, taking away, making the sides very narrow, um, making, you know, just creating bottleneck areas that slows speed down. And then you anger people, you, you know, take away space for people to, pull to the side and things like that. But the one thing that really does do things is, I mean, roundabouts work to, to calm traffic down. There's a lot of cal traffic calming measures that, that can happen. Um, but, you know, probably the biggest thing for Bay Road is the current condition of Bay Road near Belchertown. I, look, you will not see me fighting for a quick... Um, if that gets repaved, it's going to be a whole that. different story. Oh, I know. Yeah. Um, the only caution I would have is, is I agree with you about the narrowing and we're also really trying to push bike lanes and, and yeah, um, I know there's yeah, all so conflicts. They, every time. They, don't, they don't go together. So um, that's, I, I recognize that that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you'll see me out there with a little pickaxe making some more potholes. <laughs> don't, tell so, me, don't tell this recorded. Um, I don't like the, tr the idea that a terrible road is traffic calming, such as that horrible block from Northampton Road to Amity on Lincoln. That is an insane block. And every time I bring up that it, you can't ride your car, drive your car over it, I'm told it's traffic calming. But on something like Bay Road, couldn't you have speed cameras? I mean, couldn't you have a camera that flashes and actually tickets people for speeding? Wouldn't that take care of it? They do have devices like that. It, it, we'd have to look at how, I mean, the council has a surveillance bylaw um, that we'd have to look at because um, th th they're very controversial. And statistically right. significant in terms of their help. Interesting. All right. So, um, Paul, you were going to tell us something about, was was this the, the message you were going to give us on the roads? Because I thought there was, what it said on the agenda was in Massachusetts General Law Chapter 90, 17C and 18B. 
Is is that what you were telling us? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, oh, right. Is that Paul? Do you think that'll be ready for the next meeting? You know, we've just added a lot more things because yeah, I was just on the twenty-five mile. Worried. So I, let me. I, I, I summarize. I'll summarize. I'll write to them. Guilford's away for the next week. He's on vacation next week. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll see if they if it's going to be available for the next meeting or not. But. Um, and we're already asking Guilford to look at all of our water and sewer comments for we're supposed to we're getting him those at the end of a week from today okay. um, and asking him and Amy to look at those. So I just don't want to put too much on them. And then mm -hmm. we have to go through them at our next meeting. So I didn't want to mm -hmm. like pile on too much. Obviously, it's Dorothy. It's up to you. I just was tracking oh, in my uh, how much. So I mean, the first question is how long will you think this will take given vacation schedules and stuff? So I, I'll pose that first and then come back to you. OK. So what I'm suggesting, um, well, we have transportation advisory committee. Um, we and we have what I want to do is to do a little bit of agenda planning. But should we at this moment, should we um, have your appointments and then sure. talk about the future agendas? Sure. So you have a memo. This is a portion portion of the committee of the solar bylaw working group, Janet McGowan, who represents the planning board, Dwayne Brieger, Energy and Climate Action Committee. Laura Pagliaro uh, of the Conservation Commission, Jack Jemsek of the Water Supply Protection Committee. The, the No one initially volunteered from the Board of Health. They're going back to see if there's anybody who really will do it. Um, the health director is gonna reach out again. Uh, we have been trying to schedule uh, interviews with the, we have a lot of interest for the two resident members. So we will hopefully have that done. That's actually scheduled. So I hopefully have that done for your next meeting. Okay. But you want us to approve the names you yes, put forward? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. You you read them all just then. Yes. Right. Okay. And they all are tied with a particular with some kind of a board or something. They're officially, they're filling official spots. It's selected the, by the board itself, right? Right. Okay. So, do we need a uh, anyone want to do a motion, um, Anna? I have a motion, but if Andy had a question before. No, I th uh, what happened was Paul answered my question before oh. I asked it. Okay. All right. Uh, I move to recommend to the town council the approval of the following town manager appointments to the solar bylaw working group. Janet McGowan representing the planning board, Dwayne Brager from East Energy and Climate Action Committee, Laura Pagliarulo from the Conservation Commission, and Jack Jemsek from the Water Supply Protection Committee, effective for terms effective immediately expiring May 31st, 2023. Okay. okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Um, now I'll call the roll. Uh, okay, um, Anika Lopes. Yes. Uh, Andrew Steinberg. Yes. And Anna Devlin Gauthier. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Okay, so we have four yeses and one absent. Okay, that is done. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about future agenda items, and I have a bunch of stuff here, but what I don't have is, is a neat list of dates handy of future meetings. Um, so I can slowly look through my date book to find them, or maybe somebody has them quickly. I mean, I know we have, okay, I can do, we have one June 2nd. I have this all written down somewhere, but I couldn't find the place. June 16 and June 30th. And then the next one is July 21st. Now, is that correct? Yes, I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, okay, so that's nice. That's nice. That gives us a, a bit of a break there. Um, okay. So what we know we have on June 2nd, we have water and sewer. Is that correct? That's correct. And as a reminder, everyone needs to send me their track changes by Thursday at the very latest or you out. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Water and sewer. It wouldn't get sent on. So please send them to me by Thursday. No, I've been trying to do it, my dear. Uh, just I've had almost no time. It's okay. I'm um, sending, that, sending that to everyone. Not just not, a, not anyone in particular. No okay, well, I certainly feel guilty. So um, let's see, where's this list? Okay, then we have TAC, um, and that we and can we do that on the same water sewer meeting, or should we do that on June 16th? 
I don't know what your comments, what kind of comments you're getting on the water. So if there's a lot that will take time, I think, yeah. I, I think to be, I mean, I, I guess it's hard to say without looking ahead. I could see just based on some of Rob's comments, my comments, Mandy's comments, we've got a lot um, and we are going through it line by line and it's two long documents. So I, I could see it taking the meeting and I wouldn't want Tracy to have to sit through mm -hmm the whole thing and then not get, you know what I mean? Oh, we'll do water and sewer and we're gonna, we, we Paul thinks he's gonna have another appointment or two. Right. Okay. All right, then June 16th, we would have TAC. Um, Dorothy, can I ask a question? Yes, uh, please so do. This uh, is, an informal this, discussion right here. Okay, so this is uh, clarifying the role of TAC and reviewing their charge, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Are we supposed to, so, reviewing their charge are we the ones who would the charge comes from you paul right so it's it, just reviewing for our understanding it does but you know they since they're advising advising the many times they're advising the council um mm -hmm. and there was some confusion early on in the council's life um where tax sort of took on some things and got sort of castigated for weighing in on something that wasn't perceived to be within their purview parking specifically so um just sort of like i think they would like to know it and the original charge was a mishmash of and andy knows this of multiple committees all coming together and sort of saving everything i think it's worth it to make some time what does the council want and in terms of advice from tech and when do you want it and it gives them clarity for what it's worth i have those same questions for ecac and so it's yep. helpful for us to think and so what i'm thinking about is like whatever we whatever questions we're, we're figuring out for TAC would be really great yeah. to do for ECAC and um, Disability Access Advisor, DAAC as well. No, those are three major the, um, two memos that Tracy sent me, and I think that will really uh, inform our discussion. Um, it, they, they were very helpful and thoughtful, and uh, we can discuss this and then get things clarified. Yep. Uh, and um, so I see that as a, as a friendly meeting um but um hopefully <laughs> it, should, it should be but it, it, it involves a lot of things it you know um transportation partly in the complete streets there's a, a lot of pieces to it and a lot of complicated aspects so um, the, sorry you mentioned complete streets which is like a big other thing are you hoping to talk about complete streets as a separate item uh well it's just one of the items that is part of or possibly part of tax an area where tax does not have a control or province of its own what it is is this advisory and it yep. brings um, information onto topics that we bring up and certainly we in tso have a lot of areas where their expertise is useful I and understand. whether we follow it or not is up to us and you know whatever but i do understand so, that oh sorry go ahead paul so, so yeah, I don't think we have to talk about the substance of it, but the keeper of the public way, do you want advice from an independent committee to give it to you? And that's the question. Yeah. And then then the, the content is what you're gonna talk about during that meeting. Yeah. I, I, I got hung up specifically on the phrase complete streets and wasn't sure if you were also asking for a review of the complete streets program. No, um, it's, it's whether that should be in their, in their purview or not is the question. It. Thank you, right. okay, thank you. So, but as you can see, there's a lot of topics there. So um, I'm just trying to, so if we have TAC on June 16th, um, then there are a couple of other things that um, when I was trying to organize my papers, I, I thought about and wondered about whether we, they should get in our agenda. So for example, the question of zero waste, there seems to be some, some work on that. Do we wanna talk about that? Um, do we have, um, Certainly there's some questions about the parking garage, um, the engineer for the checking out the Boltwood garage, when is that happening? Um, a number of people have suggested, including Andy, that North, just as a try out North Pleasant Street be made a one-way street and that we have better signage to the parking lots there. Um, I do know that there's a very organized counting of cars parking that's taking place every day now um, that people are making records. Um, and that part of this exploration could include Andy's suggestion. You know, Andy, you may want to talk yeah, about it. It was not North Pleasant, however, it was Prospect. Of course, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No wonder Paul no, is the, 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 Just as a reminder, 
the, the question was, if people were able to come from Amity Street to that parking lot, whether it's a lot or garage, would it increase usage because people would be starting from um, closer to the library, the cinema and the Drake, which are the what's drawing them, and they mm -hmm. would see the sign finding that parking lot down that little alley next to CVS is less visible and more difficult. So uh, that's why uh, the question was, and Guilford had a second suggestion, which was um, instead of making it one way all the way, just make it two way between Amity Street and the parking facility, whether it be a lot or a garage, so that people could come in and out going okay. towards there and do away with parking on that section of the street. And he just threw that out as an alternative mm -hmm. approach. Uh, you know, thank you so much for clarifying that. I remember that something had been said and I didn't get it at the time. Now I get, now I get, I can visualize it. Um, Anna. So I think the, uh, you mentioned zero waste. Um, I think that the next, my understanding of the next step in that is that some other counselors are, are considering working on a bylaw. I don't know what's, I'm not one of them, but um, I think that would be the next step. I don't know what TSO, I'm curious what you would want TSO to do with regards to zero waste. And then the other thing that I was, and she's, Shalini left, but um, she said she was working on an outreach matrix. And that's something that, um, I don't know what, what the status of that is, but I don't wanna lose that. Cause I know she's, I think she's working on it. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, so we have the print of outreach, okay. Um, Andy, your hand is up. Yeah, no, I was, uh, to follow up on what Anna just said, if there are a group of counselors who are thinking about working on zero waste, you really need to tell them to get in touch with me, whether I have an active role in joining them or not. Uh, there was a committee that existed for, not, for a long time, the um, Recycling Refuse Management Committee or whatever, I think was the title, but I was the select board liaison to that committee. And they, we spent a lot of time and I was a participant in some of those discussions talking mm -hmm. about zero waste and talking about uh, trash regulations, which is really actually within the purview of the Board of Health. So that it's a complex issue and uh, but I've spent a lot of time on it over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I can add, and the board of, they, it was presented to the Board of Health and they determined it wasn't something that they were had the capacity to take on as a priority for them. Part of that is the Board of Health has very few people. Um, it's not but, the number of people, it's what they just didn't prioritize it as a policy. And, and it's a problem because it's their regulation mm. that is incorporated into the statutory scheme. And uh, so if they aren't willing to deal with it, then we get into this question as to, can we change who's the regulatory body, which may not be possible because of state law, um, and if we can, should we? So uh, if we think that it needs to be revisited and the body that's charged with responsibility is um, not willing to make it a priority, uh, it's a difficult problem that we've got to address. I, I've been getting letters on, on zero waste. I, you know, some, sometimes issues, their moment, their time comes. And I think this is, one that people are thinking of now. Um, but um, we don't have to do anything until something, we're not initiating it. Uh, I was just wondering if, if we, if it was good, if there was anything to come to us at some point. Um, Andy, are you, is your hand still up for another no, question? I to Anna. Anna. Uh, so what I'm trying to look for, well, I was trying to look for the um just to see if we'd covered everything in our transition document um 
and I'm looking at, I actually, Paul, I found a map of speed limits, so you can take that off your list. Um, Cause that was referred <laughs> to us by CRC that what we just, what we just talked about. Um, does anybody know if there's anything that we missed? One of the things on here was the parking um, follow up from the parking study, I believe. Andy, I don't know if you're, if you've got any insights. Um, well, there had been the downtown parking working group that had made some recommendations at the time that it dissolved during the terms of the first council. Uh, it was a committee that was appointed still back in select board days and uh, it dissolved in the first council term. And uh, there's some concern that some of their recommendations have not been completely addressed. And we those, that report exists in writing. Um, Other, oh, should, we, should we bring that, at least look at that and see where we are? I don't mean deal with it, but I mean, just look at it and see where we are on this June 16 meeting where we're meeting with TAC or should we are put you that- putting, Are you putting speed limits on the 16th or not? Because you can't do all this at one meeting, I don't okay, think. Let's just do speed, TAC and speed limits because we started it. Mm -hmm. okay. So then we have, um, there is work to do on the parking thing. And another area we missed is town gown. That's in our charge and we haven't done anything. Let me just send, uh, since you mentioned TAC, TAC did talk briefly about speed limit, just to recognize that the issue was on our um, agenda and they were essentially uh, in their discussion portion of their meeting saying that they were waiting to see whether we as a committee at TSO were going to ask them to take that on and they sort of recognized it. And so they put it in their possible okay. parking lot, but only if asked by our committee. Right. And just to clarify, Andy was just there. He's there, our liaison to TAC. And he was at the meeting, couldn't stay for the whole meeting because we overlapped. Um, okay. So that was good for the 16th TAC and discussing speed limits. Um, Paul has a question. Yes, Anika. Paul has a question. Oh, Paul. Yeah, come in. So, so Anna has just, um, so I guess the, it, that is exactly the type of thing we want to work out with TAC because, you know, we don't know, are they to wait for you to ask them, ask them for something? Are they supposed to initiate things? Um, it's, it's exactly that kind of question that we want to resolve with them because sometimes we send things to TAC. Sometimes um, when we present a road way recommendation, you expect us to have already gone to TAC and DAAC. Um, so I just want to get those, mm -hmm. what your expectations are established. Let's see who. Okay, Anna. All right. So looking, I found the memo. Um, Paul, this talks about an, the automatic carryover of participatory budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, should we be putting that on an agenda to start? That's up to you. I mean, I think the last council chose not to do anything. They got the report. And they chose not to do anything with it. Andy, I, or I'm I'm curious, Dorothy, it's if a, if it's a through you, uh, if I can ask Andy his thoughts on just as the finance person. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you want more information on it, um, I would first go to Kathy because I think that Kathy, if I recall, was the counselor member of the task force that was charged by the charter. The other person, uh, um, well, uh, never mind that I come back to me later, but in any event, uh, I think that what was the concern was is that there was, and there was a written report and we should get this council the written report and refresh our collection that was presented to the first um, council, and I think it was a, um, a slideshow done on PowerPoint. The mm -hmm. uh, concern was is that uh, there really wasn't money available to have a meaningful process right now, and they were looking for ways to establish the principle of 
citizen participation in planning. And uh, one of the things is to really strengthen the JCPC practice of having uh, citizen recommendations for projects to consider to JCPC. But um, there were to, to actually create a budget as was done in Cambridge um, and uh, it, letting, uh, you know, giving it to the citizen board to come up with how do we spend this chunk of money that we have so many capital needs that it was not something we could reasonably expect now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I know JCP JCPC is revisiting the resident request process. Um, so maybe that's a good first step. And then the only mm -hmm. other thing that was on that list that I um, wanted to make sure we, we talked about was um, uh, the, rev the uh, community impact process um, to look at, it was part of the public way review process. Um, TSO had looked at what's the kind of the step-by-step -step that we go through when we review public ways requests. But one of the things that came out of that NCRC was saying that we need to think about if we are, if we want to implement a um, community impact process for, um, for different projects and what that would look like. And CRC said that TSO should do it for like town services, um, or I think, sorry, I lost the document, but things like road changes or things uh, of that nature, looking at what the community impact is and what would be measured in that type of report. Okay, so I, I just want to say that the uh, participatory budget, I remember re reading their report uh, recently, and this is my personal opinion. I did not see that there was a need for that because we have so many forums and ways of getting information out. Um, so there is a connection between uh, that and the impact statement, but I think that the suggestion of strengthening citizen participation in the JCPC process, that sounds reasonable, but having a group do a shadow budget, I, I, just, I just think we, I don't see that as useful to a town which doesn't have enough staff to do all the work that is being required. Um, I think that it, come, it comes out of the charter. Yeah, it's a you charter. Go back to, there's oh. a charter section on um, this very topic, and that um, it was Meg Gage um, who was on the Charter Commission, and then Meg was the, uh, I think, chair of the commission that was appointed, because I think what the charter says, if I recall, is something like that the council during its first term shall appoint a commission to investigate the feasibility of uh, a citizen budgeting process. And uh, so that it came out of that. And she was the one who was actually, I think, the major presenter to the first council in the report. So and then just to note that I'm sorry. and said that she didn't see that we could do it now. Paul, please go ahead. And just, and just to know that the charter requirement was met. It was, it was supposed to set up a charter participatory budgeting commission do its due diligence, give a del report to the to the council, and then the council could do what could ignore it, can throw it away, can act on it, can do whatever it chose. So there's no okay. requirement for the council to act on it if they don't want to. Thank you. That's very, very interesting um, information. Now, the community impact process um, seems to have two points to me. Um, one is we have open forums and people can speak, but I think it su suggests that, that some of the town staff do some of the work. Isn't that right, Anna? Because mm, Not necessarily. I think so what it is, is basically um, it's, it's not an open forum. It's it's basically like a set of questions we would ask for any project to determine <clears throat> what some of the impacts on the community might be. So it, what it does is it does take out some of the elements that you miss when you only have public comment mm -hmm. in terms of, of gathering um, ideas of the impact, right? Because not everyone can participate in public comment. So you miss a lot of uh, really important input. So what a community um, impact process can do is say, 
all right, how many houses are within the vicinity? How many, like, is it within a school? I'm, I'm throwing random things out there, but it's more of a metric in my mind. It's more of a metric that we could look at. Um, it, it, this is a bigger project. Like, I want to be very clear. This, this feels in my mind is like a bigger project, um, but it, it would mean that they were quite, they would be questions that we would ask of town staff or counselors who were proposing changes. Um, I don't know. And I'm, I'm happy to hear Paul's input on whether or not he thinks it's necessary, but in my mind, a set of, a set of questions that we use to determine elements of community impact that we might not otherwise hear about would be helpful. I would like to make comment. I, I was on CRC when that was done. I remember that the, so many of the questions were very good and that there were many aspects that seemed valuable. I guess it just kind of dropped because of the set usual question of who's gonna do it and who's got the time. Uh, but I agree that there were a lot of excellent questions. It just wasn't clear how it was gonna be implemented. Um, and Paul, shall I, do you want to speak first or shall I have Anika? I okay, tell, yeah. go ahead. Uh, so this could give, um, give a push towards what the CPOs were just talking about. Um, you know, some of the platforms that they were talking about allow folks to participate in live time whenever is convenient for them. You know, so this is something to keep in mind when you want to reach out with, you know, questions or gather information from the community. This allows people to, you know, submit their information at whatever time works for them without having to utilize staff to do so. Right. So you're saying on using the in internet, um, I find that interesting, but not representative, but um, Anna. I mean, I don't think any any tool is, I mean, public comment certainly isn't perfect in terms of being representative based on data too. So I, I, I think, I, Anika, to your point, I really like the idea of opening, continuing to open avenues. When I talk about a community impacts uh, kind of checklist though, it's not actually, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to phrase this. It's not, it's not impact that we are seeking out input on, which we do and we want, it's impact on things that we can tell from data, right? So it's it's about um, like um, it's about population, it's about age, it's about things like that, right? That aren't necessarily um, reliant on people being able to access whatever means of of input we have, which I agree should be expanded, right? So I, I think it's a yes. And, in my mind, it's a yes and, right? Mm -hmm. um, expanding the opportunities for engagement so that it's not kind of two tracks, either email us or, or be there for the meeting. Um, but it's also saying, even if you're not, even if you're not checked in at all, we're taking you into account, right? And we already try to do that, but if, and I'm speaking in hypotheticals here, but if there were a way to design a community impact assessment, right? A community impact framework that we use, um, we'd be able to do that a little bit better or at least try. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I understand that wouldn't be there, but uh, Dorothy, you know, keep in mind if we are going forward and there's other reasons to use this platform that it does allow for live engagement as well. Right. 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 But a lot. Of, so as Anna is saying, a lot of these things we're looking for are facts, which the town would have, which staff would have. No, I, I understand. No, I misunderstood. I, <laughs> I get you after the fact. I understand what what you what you were saying now. And and Dorothy, I don't know the answer to that, right? And I'm not trying to create more work. I think we what I want to do is kind of explore it as a committee so that we could say, is this feasible? Is it data we have? Is it you know is this too big of a lift um, with our our current staffing? Would it be too big of a lift if we asked for this for each project, right? But I think uh, mm -hmm. a discussion on it would be. Um, yeah, I, th I think it sounds like something that, to me, it sounds like a good thing to do. So now I'm going to put Paul on the spot. That's um, I'm, curious. I'm curious for Paul's take on it. I'm sorry to interrupt, folks, but it, it feels like we're getting into the meat of this topic. And oh, I want to be aware of, of, of the right, time, right. too. And we have one more thing on the agenda. So I, I, I don't want to interrupt a, a d discussion that sounds really good. But um, this sounds more like just scheduling upcoming agendas. So I just want to put a the words out of my here. mouth. Thanks. Okay. Thank so, you. so can we put that for June 30th, discussing um, community impact? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we do need, thank you, Athena. 
Okay. Um, okay, so we have June 2nd, water and sewer and appointment, June 16th, TAC and speed limits, June 30th, community impact. Uh, we didn't put zero waste down. We didn't put town gown down. Um, not that we know exactly what we're going to talk about with town gown, except that it's in our charge. And it's something that people are talking about in terms of, of um, cooperation and, and um, financial and otherwise between the university. So I'm going to just ask Paul, so because we're going to wind up here um, for July 21st. Can we talk I, I, about town or not? Talk about what? Town and gown, or sure, that's on sure. charge. We can dealt with it, but um, yeah, I mean, I think you don't know what's coming down the road, so I would suggest that you, you've got the next two means mapped out. That's pretty good, and then be prepared to adjust the next two means. We have some things penciled in, um, okay. and that's good. Okay, I, I keep thinking, oh, there's going to be nothing more to talk about. So, um, and if not, then we just won't have to meet for the summer, which would be really great. Um, and we'd all enjoy that. Okay, uh, we have to approve the minutes, um, which we have of the May 5th meeting, I believe. Is that correct, Athena? Yes. Um, okay, and I have uh, read it seriously when it first came out and I skimmed it again today and I don't see anything that I would need to change or add. Uh, did anyone have any additions or comments on the minutes for uh, the 5th of May meeting? Okay, then... Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I move we approve the minutes of May 5th, 2022. Okay, and a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Then I'll call the roll. Uh, Anika Lopes? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Anna Devlin Gauthier? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Okay, four yes and one absent. That is that. Um, do we have anything else that we are supposed to do or does anyone have something they want to bring up or shall we entertain um, dismissal? What do we call the word? Adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we all set then? Everybody happy? Uh, Paul, would you like to have the last word on whatever you want to say? <laughs> nope. I would like to say good night. That's my last word. <laughs> I offered it to you. I gave you the chance. Just remember that. Okay. Then uh, good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Paul.